Welcome to Open Tables. With your hosts, Cynthia Sue Larson. But it's okay to for everybody to change. It's okay to let things go. And that's really powerful. Christopher Anatra. The universe is based on commerce. You know me as the quantum businessman. Jerry Hicks. I feel like I've woken up in a parallel dimension where everybody's exactly the same. They look the same, same memories, generally speaking, but they're different. <laughs> and Shane Robinson. Nobody has all the answers, so everybody's welcome to share their ideas, and it really expands our consciousness when we do that. Open table. Unique perspectives for a new view of reality. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the International Mandela Effect Conference Open Tables Season 3, Episode 2 adventures in mandela land that's right folks it's so good to have every last one of you guys here for yet another conference on uh, imac we love having every last one of you guys here i see you guys over in chat we'll get to you guys in just a moment but first we've got a little bit of you know legality stuff to go through so let's get the boring stuff out of the way the content you are about to watch is meant for thought and consideration Please be respectful of each other and opinions shared. This is a safe space to express thoughts, ideas, and information. Please note that no copyright infringement is intended with regard to exclusion of short excerpts of material that are included in accordance with fair use under Section 107 of the Copyright Act. All right, I'm trying to get that as quick as I can. Not quick enough yet. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that is the legality of things. I'd like to go ahead now and bring in my incredible team. I don't do this alone. I could not ever do this alone. I've got a great group of people that back us up, uh, starting with our vice president, Miss Cynthia Sue Larson from <laughs> Shifters.com with the most adorable glasses ever. I love it. <laughs> Next up, we have our uh, secretary, Mr. Shane Robinson, unbiased and on the fence. I love it. Absolutely. Go with the heart. Yes, sir. He doesn't have any glasses on. Uh, next up, we have our treasurer, the amazing uh, Christopher Anatra. You know him as the quantum businessman. <laughs> Hey, Dr. MSN. Ventures in Mandela Land. <laughs> also known as Doc Emmett Brown, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, right before we come on, I seen you put those on. I was losing it laughing as the intro was coming. In. <laughs> I love it. Uh, anyway, we've got an amazing show for you folks. Real quick, let's go over the agenda, and then we can get into the main discussion. We've got this episode sponsors, as always, and we have a ton, folks. The sponsors are lining up at the door. We cannot get them in quick enough. Uh, updates from Cynthia, Chris, Shane, and of course, yours truly. Uh, there has been an IMEC shout out this month. Who shouted out IMEC? This we'll have to find out. Uh, followed by the Dodo Bird Return. Is, is this a mistype? Ladies and gentlemen, this sounds like an interesting show. Uh, followed by Woolly Mammoth. So from Dodo Birds to Woolly Mammoths, I'm starting to see a theme here. What are we talking about when it comes to those? And what is Vivapary, vivipary, vivipary. How does it, okay, team, stop real quick. How is this word said? Can somebody please pronounce this for me? <laughs> vivipary. I'm just kidding. Vivipary. <laughs> I'll go with that. That sounds much better than my vivipary, ladies and gentlemen. I can't even say the word. Hopefully, the explanation's a bit easier than my trying to explain or uh, uh, pronounce it. Uh, stick around. We'll find out how many more times Jerry messes this word up. Followed up with the island of Bermeja. At least I hope that's the pronunciation. Not good with some words today. I really need to watch making these things. Uh, Japan's new phase. Remember, you've got to read them, Jerry. 
uh, followed by the circuit board sky. What is a circuit board sky, folks? Have you been seeing circuit boards in the sky? Is someone throwing them up there? Why are they in the sky? We'll find out shortly. Uh, followed by ME Chatbot Time. So if you guys remember the last episode, we went and played with the chat GPT. Well, I think that's going to become kind of a regular segment here at uh, iMac Open Tables. Is we're going to do it again this time. We're going to ask it some more questions. Absolutely Mandela Effect related. Why wouldn't it be? And then we've got our mailbag. Got a great mailbag this month. I can't wait to get to that. All the mailbags are great. Who am I kidding? But we've got a really good one following our theme this month. And then, of course, get your questions ready for the Q&A at the very end once again right before we get into our sponsors i know i've been rambling give me just a couple more minutes folks we'll we'll get into this i want to give a shout out real quick to our chat over here on youtube that's been hanging out with us live we appreciate you guys uh luther wessel fa q then uh <laughs> sketch -a grime instrumentals Unbiased and on the fence, hanging out over here, <laughs> moderating. I know the International Mandela Effect Conference is moderating over here also. Uh, Colin, glad to see you over here. Nacha Keta, always good to see you, my friend. Uh, Bill Knight, we have definitely have got an international uh, group of people here today. Lisbeth Sven S.A. from Belgium says hello. Glad to see you, Lisbeth. Uh, Rain Hawk, Jacqueline Klein and yellow sun glad to see all of you guys here and i of course am over in the chat myself it's always a pleasure to see you guys make sure you share us out everywhere let everyone know what we're doing here let them know that we are live and we'd love to have them here with us all right ladies and gentlemen with that said i've rambled enough i'm sure you're tired of hearing my voice so let's let the rest of the team talk let's jump on into our first sponsor of the evening also, real quick, shout out to our producer behind the scenes, Heather. She does an absolutely wonderful job at, at pulling everything together, getting us on screen, keeping our slides going. Shout out to you. Absolutely amazing. You don't get enough credit for all the work you do behind the scenes, Heather. So we really appreciate that. Ladies and gentlemen, sponsor number one. The Indian Rollerbird. This was sent in by a community member. Remember, if you want to send us anything that you find, send it to team at imec.world. T-E-A-M at I-M-E-C dot W-O-R-L-D. All right. Uh, State bird of Karnataka. I'm assuming this is India. This is gorgeous. This looks like something that the Native American got a hold of a coloring book and, and painted this so beautifully. Uh, team, what do you guys think of this? Tell me something about this bird. Well, this is the state bird of Karnataka. That is India. And what's surprising about that is I would have thought I would have seen this before, but brand new to me and the spectacular plumage is just extraordinary just going from these light blue sky blue into that deep 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 um, indigo and purple violet it's very dramatic and exactly it does look like a fantasy creature so it's, uh, um, just the way the colors are distributed it seems very unusual reminds me of a pokemon or something you know it's <laughs> i can see that yeah I think it's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And, you know, speaking of the colors like Cynthia, I like that, you know, the blue kind of represents the throat chakra. And, you know, um, part of this unveiling we see is a lot of people's voices trying to get through censorship or whatever, you know, even we deal with it here, you know, but people's voices not being heard. So I love the fact that it's blue and it represents communication um, because of the chakra, in my opinion. And it's Gosh, that design is absolutely stunning. I can't imagine that I've seen this before and not remembered it, you know. Right. Thanks for mentioning fifth, um, that chakra. That's the fifth chakra. We're going into the fifth world, according to a lot of indigenous expectation and prophecy. So it makes sense, along with the golden timeline. We would see blue animals, and we definitely are. This one's new for me. But I don't know if it's new for you guys, too. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely new for me. And going along with the blue color and the throat chakra, like when I see this, I get like charisma, which is something that we could use with our throat chakra, with our mm -hmm. voice box and our tongue. And also clear audio skills. That's also part of the, the throat chakra complex. So, you know, just seeing a bird like this, seeing the bright blues, breathtaking, you can't help but like unsee this once you see a bird like this it's like wow you don't forget it so for me this was completely new to my reality and i'm very appreciative of it 
It's gorgeous. Like I said, it's something I would expect to see at like the top of a totem pole. Like the the colors and it, it looks the, yeah. the design on the wings like it just looks like something like that. It, I think it's gorgeous. I I, th- I think I've never heard of it before. Uh, definitely Mandela to me, but then again, I always say I don't know all the animals, so you know I, I want to preface with that. But I would think I'd remember it if I seen this one. Like I I love the blue color. That that's one of my favorite colors, especially in those shades. Yeah, those uh, this combination. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is. Natalie Butler in the chat says, stunning. Never seen that bird before. Yeah. It does look like an indigenous totem, says Raven Hawk. There's a feeling of nobility to it as well. It feels like it's calling us to rise to our highest level of, um, of our own personal stature, sovereignty. Absolutely. And that is sponsor number one, ladies and gentlemen. Nope. Next, we have sponsor number two, the yellow box fish. This looks like something made in Photoshop, ladies and gentlemen. I do not believe this is a real thing. Are you? Is this real, Chris? It's totally real. We got some 90-degree angles going on here. So, yeah, another golden-type animal that's come on into the timeline and into our reality and into our consciousness. And it all started with wombats. I know. Right. I was going to say. I was going to say. <laughs> I was going to bring it up. Yeah. yeah. I remember when you put me on the spot. You're like, you're asking me. I was, I was so surprised. Why would I answer if there's anything square in nature? And what I came up with was pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> I, I did not know that particular fact that you had come up with about the wombat droppings being cubes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was the most recent example I'd seen, which is kind of a weird one. But um, here so we go. So thank this... you, universe, right, for giving yes. us this beautiful example of another cube. Right, a cube <laughs> fish. Here we yeah. go. The box fish, re- box fish. Okay, Jerry, let's get that tongue to work. And here we go. Try that again. Box fish. There we go. Can reach an average size of three inches and adapt well to life in captivity if provided with plenty of rock rock work. And adequate swimming space. The diet consists of sponges, tunicates, worms, and crustaceans. So it definitely has a meat um, diet. That's interesting. Yeah, I wanted to mention too, because Jerry, you said something about like the, a cube fish, right? Yeah. So this is going to sound strange to everyone, but like when I see, when I look into the Akashic records, it's going to sound really strange the concept of like, I'll call it a cube earth and then platonic solid, a sphere around it. And then when you look at the planet Saturn, okay, to me, it's a Mandela effect, but when the Voyager mission went over it, it took a picture of the, 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 the hexagon of Saturn, which I had never seen before. If you orient a cube in a certain way, it forms a hexagon. So is it something about cubes and golden cubes and related to all this i think there's clues in all of these mandela effects but as we were just talking i was starting to like connect connect the dots as far as those type of things go about how our holographic reality is based on so yeah now that's interesting yeah twist everyone's mind a little bit (laughs) to mess with the flat earthers i used to put out hashtag cubed earth (laughs) <laughs> no, I, I believe that I, I know it sounds crazy, but when you look at the Akashic records, there is a concept of a cube earth, which is really weird. And it could explain some of the cube stuff, but having a golden cube like this from the ocean, I think is positive. Well, you know, to be honest, if you consider the idea of the multiple timelines and multiverse, the concept of the multiverse is that literally any possible configuration can be played out, right? So whether it be a square, a flat, a round, a triangle, a rectangle, whatever shape there may be, a cylinder earth for all that matter, you know, uh, that possibility can literally play out in any form across the entire multiverse, right? Now, Jerry, you're so- talking about play out. Could we play maybe a video clip? Yeah, I'm still having a problem <laughs> believing this thing is real. Can somebody show me a video of this fish? Oh. Okay, then. 
Look at the eyes. Definitely not a child's toy. Wow, look at this thing, folks. They're so wild. <laughs> That's adorable. It looks like a piece of fruit. Makes me want a kiwi. <laughs> By the way, too, while we're on the subject of, of cubes, some of you may have heard of the concept of a four-dimensional cube, which is uh, called a, a tesseract. Yes. And, and mm -hmm. if you've ever seen animations of it, it's, it's, really, it's really crazy. It's really out, outstanding. But you, when you begin to understand how when we look at something in a two-dimensional view, and then our expansiveness ex expands and we see it as a three-dimensional cu cube. And now there's a concept of, the of a four-dimensional cube and how that could be oriented in different ways. It really kind of stretches the mind. So as we're advancing, so to speak, is it possible that one of the things we'll begin to understand is, is maybe even to see things in a four-dimensional aspect? So that whole 4D cube tesseract thing might start to become more important in our reality. So. As we were talking, I'm like, oh, the Tesseract. So I was just watching videos about the Tesseract because I saw somebody that had a, a virtual reality game where he, he took a 4D cube and was able to keep orienting it. And it was like mind blowing about all the different shapes it would take. Wow, yeah. That is definitely an incredible um, uh, concept of the Tesseract. I've, I've seen it too. I know what you're talking about. I've, I've looked into that whole 4D uh, design of different shapes. There are a couple different shapes. Uh, the Tesseract isn't the only one. There's one you can have here in 3D that's, a, I believe, it's a 4D object. It's called the uh, Klein model. Uh, something interesting to look into also. Uh, speaking of interesting, our next uh, sponsor's very interesting. A golden beetle, ladies and gentlemen, from the yellow straight into the golden, keeping this golden timeline theme, of course. Also sent in by Alicia Thompson. Thank you, Alicia, Thank you. so much you've been sending in to us. We appreciate it. Native to Eastern Northern America, uh, very little biological information is available on this species. Fairly small, measuring 5 to 7 millimeters in length. Uh, associated with the sweet potato and morning glory plants of that nature. A golden beetle, folks. More golden animals on our golden timeline. And we did actually cover a golden tortoise beetle previously. I think that was the first season or something <laughs> of these open tables. So that one had a tortoise outline on the shelf. This one's entirely gold. So that's what makes it really noteworthy. So it seems like that that golden tortoise beetle was new to us at the time and now it's this beetles this bug is even golder more completely golden <laughs> and i i didn't hear about a completely golden bug at that time uh, a couple of years ago so, so these are guys. in eastern north america so the east coast I, I i live in the east north america these things ain't familiar to me i've never seen one I'm I so think weird. somebody dropped their earring or something. <laughs> <laughs> the Egyptians will want to steal this one, says Raven. <laughs> <laughs> it does have the Egyptian kind of look to it, doesn't it, with the whole golden scarab and all that? Yeah, that's exactly it. It looks like that kind of scarab. I think smaller. This is smaller than a scarab. Perhaps. And it looks perfectly reflective. Isn't that like actually the reflection of the person taking the picture in the top of the shell there? I, I mean, think so. Like, and like transparent around the edge. And notice that there's a transparent kind of an edge around it. You can see right. through. Which the tortoise beetle had that too that we looked at. Right. Which is but this, this is just a lot more gold coverage yeah. without a tortoise image. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. It's the golden snitch. From Harry Potter. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> I have to actually give credit to uh, Raider Champion. That's like something you need to catch in a game of Quidditch, he said. <laughs> 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 so we got Harry Potter fans bringing in creatures now. Is, is that the case? Did they turn the golden snitch into a beetle in reality? <laughs> I love it. I mean, it's still not the craziest thing we've ever heard of. This is IMAC after, after all. <laughs> Speaking of crazy, we're going to carry on this crazy golden timeline theme with our next animal up, the golden largemouth bass. I'm telling you folks, these sponsors are lining up at the door. We can't keep up with them. There are so many we keep finding. 
or keep being shared with us. Uh, Cynthia, did you send me this one? Yes, I did. So this is um, this is an amazingly rare specimen. It, uh, apparently, these um, large mouth bass are not usually this color. So to find one of this shade was extraordinary and just one of those once in a lifetime things. Except it seems like we keep hearing about these once in a lifetime things, and to me, it seems like they're happening more and more often. So maybe, maybe they're coming into the timeline. You know, these golden fish. And I get a good feeling about it too. It seems like it's really um, a harbinger of of the golden timeline of you know just very positive future for all of us. Golden largemouth bass, according to this article, are extremely rare. Not just rare, extremely rare. And most anglers have never seen them, let alone heard of them before. Like that matches Mandela effect if I've ever heard a Mandela effect quote, right? <laughs> the fish is a product of a genetic mutation that alters the skin pigments called xanthism. So has anybody here ever heard of xanthism? No, that seems new to me. And Chris, have you heard of that? Because we've been finding these golden animals, but I've never heard that term. Yeah, I've heard for the the, the white animals, the lucism, but not the xanthism. Yeah, no. So I thought the same thing when I was uh, looking into this too. It's, they've come up with another word now for our golden animals. Apparently, IMEC has brought way too much attention <laughs> and they had to cover their tracks. Go ahead, Cynthia. Yeah, maybe that's where the name came from. It's just the so many golden animals are showing up they have to figure out what's going on we've got everything you know monkeys birds fish um, snakes you name it <laughs> bugs <laughs> everything has been taking this gold color as we just seen from the golden beetle to the golden bass like this is across the board even the golden box fish it, it wasn't golden it was yellow but it's close enough <laughs> and, and you know it, it's worth mentioning that it, we're noticing gold but we're notice, not noticing other colors coming in it's, it specifically right. seems like gold is what's when it comes in differently. It's pretty much usually gold. Well, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, with the wolves, wolves, we white. see white, yeah. white, and with the wolves we saw other colors, right? Red, white, gold, black, <laughs> black, and black, yeah. which matches right. the that matches the prophecy for the buffalo. It, it's incredible how many prophecies are starting to come together right at this one time in history. I, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I can point to five or six of them that I, I would say are starting to fall in the place. This fish is an opportunistic feeder. Hey, so am I. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, <laughs> it's other fish, frogs, crayfish, tadpoles, insects, small rodents, snakes, and ducklings. Okay. Those last two or three are interesting. The ducklings <laughs> I get. The, the, it's, it's waterfowl, it's at the water. Okay, I'll buy that one. Small rodents and snakes. <laughs> that one trips me out. I don't see a lot of mice swimming around the, the rivers. I'm just saying. <laughs> That's a good point. I don't know how that happens. <laughs> water, water snakes, but not water rodents usually. Right. Like, are we talking like crabs? I define a water rodent. Please, I'm really curious about that. Well, it's something called a nutria here on the west coast. It looks like a large rat, but it's in the waterways. So maybe. I don't know. Well, I asked for a definition. By golly, I got one. I appreciate it. Seeking each shall find, right? Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is the golden largemouth bass. And yet another sign of this incredible timeline that we are clearly on, this, this path that we're headed down. And if you don't believe it, ladies and gentlemen, we've done, what, we're at season three, three years of golden animals. At some point, you have to say, maybe something's going on, right? <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of going on, let us go on out to our next sponsor. We have the Pink Fairy Armadillo. This thing is gorgeous. Again, are you sure this is real, guys? Pretty like sure. <laughs> It, is. Um, it looks like a squirt toy from a pool or something. <laughs> yeah. Found only in Argentina. <laughs> and it's, so, Sorry, it's pretty tiny, it. too. It's cute. It's really cute. Six inches from head to tail. Six inches. Not even a foot long. Six inches from head to tail, weighing just a quarter of a pound. That thing's light. 
I'd be scared. I'd hurt the thing just by touching it. Smallest of all the armadillo species. And I quote, ladies and gentlemen, we have another Mandela effect mm -hmm. quote. This is awesome. They're a total enigma. We don't even know if they're common or rare. <laughs> now, that's interesting. But what follows it up, Stephen, but the first question that hits on Google is, do pink fairy armadillos exist? <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, not only do they exist, they're here, but I don't ever in my life remember hearing anything about this 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 dwarf armadillo oh, what do you guys know about this thing is this new to you yeah, it's totally new to me i'd say it must be um rare you know i think enigma is the right word for it i don't think it's common i, I don't know why someone would say that it's common <laughs> if it is common it's been hiding pretty well so yeah it's new to me for sure yeah it's brand new to me i and Hard a pink armadillo it. of all things, like it's not even a standard armadillo color. Yeah, maybe it blends in with the environment in Argentina, but I can't imagine how. Um, do they have pink sand or soil? That's the Fey point. need their toys too, says Raven. Oh, that's <laughs> got me cracked. <laughs> <laughs> This is a fey pet. Okay, this makes so much more sense now, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, evolutionary biologist Simon Watts, author of We Can't All Be Pandas, says, and I quote, pink fairy armadillos does frankly sound fictitious. End quote. <laughs> 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 so don't take my word for it. Take the word of an evolutionary biologist. Yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So I always say, I don't know all the animals, but I think that guy probably does. <laughs> and he don't even know this one. So, yeah, definitely something uh, uh, of an enigma for sure, as it says here. Definitely a Mandela effect, in my opinion. We're picking up a lot of new creatures in this timeline. Are we going to have any room left for us humans? No more to worry about overpopulation. They keep picking up more animals every time we shift. <laughs> yeah, there's never going to be a shortage of sponsors, right? Literally, before we do every show, it's like another flooded. sponsor wants to come on, another sponsor wants to come on. It's like it, 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 it literally doesn't stop, right? Well, the yeah. moment we end these shows, we come up with three more. Well, we've got some that didn't fit in this show that are ready for next time. Yeah, yeah, we got, we right. got, we got, we've got another golden one for next for next month's show. Sure. Okay, at least two more golden ones. <laughs> Like, we've got so many folks that just keep coming at us and just keep sending them. Folks, do not take that as a, oh, they've got too much going on. Please, if you find something, send it in. We would love to hear from you. And you can send it, if you are, or missed it earlier, to team at imec.com or dot world, I'm sorry, uh, T E A M at I M E C dot W O R L D. And yeah. that will get to us. Go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, by the way, when you see like really cute, adorable little animals like that, that have uh, all, always existed, how come there's no cartoons about it? Or how, there, how come like it hasn't made the movies or some way into media someplace in the past? So that's another clue that what we, what we could be seeing could actually be new for a lot of people. So keep that in as mind. Well as well as the experts quoted here saying that it's new to them. Saying things like, do they even exist? <laughs> and exactly. they sound fictitious. Yeah. Exactly. Like that one zoologist who was talking about uh, one of the whales um, that we were talking about a couple months ago. I think the dolphin beaked whale. Was yeah. yeah. And he's like, I know about whales. Like, I'm a zoologist and I never heard of this whale before. So, yeah, right. the types of things that, that's happening. Hey, I know something about whales. Next slide, please. We have a brand new whale in the world. Is this right, Chris? I think you're the one sending me this. Yeah, we've got Frosty. Uh, Frosty is a, an extremely rare white newborn orca. And it was seen swimming alongside its mother in a pod of seven animals, which are known as killer whales. And I believe this picture was taken on one of those uh, whaling um, expeditions where, where they go out and do the whale watching. So, yeah. So these these white whales are becoming more and more common there was another one i think it was called casper so th this isn't our first time of talking about you know a white whale before but again the white protective type animals you know, that's 
when I read into it, that's what I get. So yeah, I think it's a great thing. And I would expect even more white whales and other white um, dolphin type species uh, coming onto the scene as well. With what I've been seeing going on in the world, we need every protector we can find. What's up, Shane? I was just reading the chat. Yeah, I think it's beautiful. I didn't know about this. I was trying to figure out a way I could turn Frosty the Snowman into Frosty the White Orca. <laughs> <laughs> it's just how my brain thinks. Sorry, Frosty the White Whale. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm not having a whale all the time that. out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it is a newborn of killer whales, which aren't actually whales, right? Those are dolphins, right? Not sure. That's a good Same question. Family, right? I know one of them that's called a whale is a dolphin. I, th I think it's that. I'm not, I'm not 100 on that. It's nice that this is an infant, so we can keep an eye on it, too. We'll probably get to see more sightings of this one, I hope. This, this frosty. Maybe it'll find a whole pot of of uh, whales like itself. We'll have a whole pot of white whales. Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, Laura Millen was on a cruise. This is where this comes from. And she says, quote, the experience was like no other. Once we saw the pod, we were all speechless. The experience was a once-in-a-lifetime event. It was absolutely beautiful. I saw the co-captain crying. I was right next to her, and the captain was shocked. I knew that this was a once-in-a-lifetime moment, so I started feeling in awe and speechless. So definitely not something you see every day, and even the boat captains were like, oh, my God. So, wow, this is absolutely incredible. You guys want to add anything? I I would just want to add one thing about that. Again, you know, I'll be the one that says all the wild, far out stuff. Um, but basically, a lot of times that people, you may have had a past life as a whale. You know, it it's not it's not out of the realm of possibilities, the way things work. So a lot of times, the captains of these whale watching expeditions, if you're drawn to go on a whale watching expedition, if you see whales like this and it brings you to tears. There could be something inside of you that remembers that experience that you may have had and you know whales are very loving creatures like they love their young they absolutely adore their young so there's a lot of love involved in whales as well so anyone that's drawn to whales you you could be associated with whales so something to think about that's pretty interesting, and I've been looking at NDEs lately, near-death experiences, and that actually, some of that goes right along with, with what I've heard uh, from those, too. So, very, very interesting, Chris. Anybody else? What he said just kind of reminded me of the new Avatar movie. I don't know if you guys have seen yeah. it yet. The no. whale. And... I've not. Should we, should we say something that's a spoiler? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead, Cynthia. <sit> <laughs> I, I haven't seen it, so I don't have the spoiler. <laughs> yeah, no, de definitely. We won't say anything, but when you see it, maybe we'll do a little show. We'll talk about Avatar, too. Okay. There's some soft disclosure, I think, in, in Avatar. Not just the main Avatar movie, but in Avatar, too, as well. So okay. Nice. Cynthia, you were about to say something? Oh, just that it seems like these animals sometimes show up um, right before we need them or right when we need them. And I noticed that California seems to keep getting these. Um, we've mentioned several off the coast of California animals. Here's another one. So it seems like California needs an awful light of an awful lot of support, light and protection. And I live in California, so I think that's true. And I appreciate the these animals showing up here. Also, that we had that clam that showed up after being extinct forty thousand years or whatever, and that's also quite welcome. The Lazarus species, the white species, the gold ones, the blue ones. So very much appreciated. I just saying thank you. That is awesome. Everybody definitely pray for California and the whole country, of course. But uh, the people of the Republic of California could definitely use some prayers. Sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, but yet yeah, it is good to see these these protectors, these light, these loving creatures coming back to the earth, bringing those harmonizations and those vibrations back into this reality. It's absolutely incredible. And hopefully they can have the intended um, effect on reality. And I know people are saying, are you, are you looking around? Everything's going crazy. You got to tear down the old to rebuild the new, unfortunately, is my opinion on that. But before we get into the wrong set of woods, 
let's move on to Rupert Sheldrake. I'm I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> Ruddy Shellduck. My bad, my bad. <laughs> I know a lot of you got a little excited there. My apologies. I, I did too. Uh, when I first seen this, I did. I seen Ruddy Sheldrake when when I first looked at this, and apparently I'm not the only one. Uh, somebody else told me they also seen the same thing. So yeah, yeah you got to go ahead and give himself up, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> I actually got when I saw this photo at first, I got really strong um, nostalgia from it. I don't know why. I don't feel like I've seen. You're not alone. You're you're not alone in that. Uh, Right there with you, bro. What is it? I mean, what was that? It was really strong. And I'm like, why would this bird give me such a strong sense of deja vu? vu. uh, Yeah, sort of like deja vu, but more like a nostalgia. Something you would have seen as a kid, but you can't place any time we would have actually seen it. Like, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if we had one of these that looked just like it's sitting on a, a, you know, I don't know, a TV. Well, we didn't even really have the TVs were the stand, right? So on the TV back then when it was a big chunk of wood. (laughs) Right, (laughs) right. Or some kind of decoration or something. I don't know, but it's like tapping into some very young nostalgia for me when I see it. But it's brand new to me, too. So. <laughs> like a yellow rubber ducky you'd have in the bathtub? Right. Rubber yeah. ducky, you're the one. Okay, yeah, I won't do that to you folks. <laughs> Known in India as the Brahmini duck. Uh, if you might know who Brahma is, that was the creator of the world according to Indian lore. So. Uh, Brahmini duck mostly inhabits water bodies such as lakes, reservoirs, and rivers, as we assume most ducks would. Nothing odd there. Uh, length of 58 to 70 centimeters. Interesting. Uh, 110 to 135 centimeter wingspan. That's a pretty good wingspan for a bird. Uh, these are very small. There are very small resident populations of the species in Northwest Africa and Ethiopia, but the main breeding ground is from Southeast Europe across the Pale Arctic to Lake Baikal, Mongolia, and Western China. So definitely not on our side of the the world, Jane. No. But I'm with you. It gives a, a, so a previous a, a, life, maybe a, right. It definitely gives a nostalgic feel to it to me too. Uh, uh, what about those those carvings that they used to put on the water? Those those uh, d- distractions. Yeah, the decoy. Thank yeah. you, decoy ducks. That's that's the only thing that comes to mind when I see it. It reminds me of maybe I've seen it as a decoy, but why would that be when it doesn't look anything like the ducks we have in America? Right. Yeah, it wouldn't be a good decoy. But by the way, I've been waiting for a golden duck to appear. Because my last name in Italian is Anitra, which means duck. So the golden duck. So I was very ex- excited. Mm-hmm. With it. And, and I just, re- before the show, I just randomly typed in golden duck. And this, and this is what came up. So sometimes if you get a hit in your mind about something, yeah. especially if it's a golden animal, just be like, oh, the golden walrus. Does that exist? And it might pop up. You never know. So keep right. that in mind. And then let us know. Let us know. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna so that's cool, cool, man. That, that that your name actually has a relation to this one. Yeah, because the roots of my name are Sicilian, and they say that a lot of people that are from Sicily, their last name is either like an animal or a fruit. So <laughs> there you go. Wow, learn something new every day, and I just learned a couple of things. There we go. Is that is that a Mandela for anybody? In Sicily, the names are fruit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> If I go to an Italian restaurant, sometimes my name's on the menu, you know, as a dish. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm not going to have that. <laughs> I couldn't imagine. Like, I've seen my first name on a menu, but I couldn't imagine my last name. Being... <laughs> <laughs> That'd be kind of wild. I did have the Jerry Pizza at one time, and I lived in Idaho. Uh, but anyway, that, that's a whole nother. I'm getting way off. Uh, another thing that we've seen in the sponsors we've seen a couple themes right we've we've seen the golden we've seen the white animals and we've seen the lazarus animals we've seen animals that keep coming back to reality so from rupert sheldrake i'm sorry ready shellduck uh to our next slide the lazarus anatolian leopard a lazarus species uh, well, I think it's just the Anatolian leopard. Is uh, we put Lazarus in there for the fact that's, uh, you know, come back to the reality. 
rare and elusive Anatolian leopard, a species previously thought to be functionally extinct, was recently caught on camera in Turkey, of all places. This is before the earthquake. So, you know, the devastating earthquake that just happened uh, earlier. So, and that, that brings to mind maybe these protector animals are noticed. Uh, I think the Lazarus species count as protectors. And this one looks golden to me. So, I think that was True. very interesting. Yeah. It does have that gold color to it. Absolutely. I didn't even really kind of recognize that till you pointed it out, but you're right. The last leopard was thought to have been seen and killed in 1974, considered extinct for 45 years. Then all of a sudden, this little dude's wandering the mountaintops of Turkey again. That is too cool. Super cool. So, again, we have these timelines that seem to be merging uh, to take a book out of Chris's or a page out of Chris's book, book out of Chris's page. That made sense, Jerry. Anyway, um, we have these timelines that seem to be merging into one timeline, uh, uh, and we seem to be getting animals that we that were extinct but alive on other timelines are coming in. Uh, perhaps animals that never were on this timeline are coming in. W would that be an accurate statement, folks? Yes, and um, this is a mountaintop discovery. Uh, just like in California, we had those wolves coming back and red foxes coming back in California that had been gone, considered extinct for the state. So it seems um, possibly interesting to notice the adjacency of, of the topography, that mountains may have something, um, there's some connection there with mountains and the return of this particular leopard. It I seems can tell like you... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, it feels if I was reading into these Akashic records, the mountains are very important because they definitely like we look at Mount Shasta, the Mount also in California, and that's considered very sacred. There's a lot going on there. Chris made a trip there recently. Um, then you look at these mountains and here we are in Turkey and there's a special energy in the mountains that we can feel. That's and, exactly what I was about to touch on when, yeah. uh, Okay, so you guys came up to the mountains with me in Idaho. Yes. Uh, that was way up, literally in the mountains. And that was a magical area. And the reason I really believe that mountains have this magical sense to them, this this true magic, I, mean, I don't even know another way to put it. I'm not talking illusion. I'm talking real energetic magic, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, is the fact of the amount of crystals and elements that are in these rocks and these mountains that are under lots and lots and lots of pressure so we know what happens to quartz under pressure we get an electric uh, discharge from it so if you figure you have a mountain that has quartz and, and god knows what other type of, of incredible minerals and, and uh, crystals and whatnot in it and they're all under pressure you're going to have an interesting energetic release uh, again mine being very 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 positive where i lived i'm sure i'm not the only case example and they're probably you know both sides of the coin but uh chris looked like you were about to say something go ahead sir yeah well i was going to say something that's that's uh in line with what you're saying um and having to do with turkey too so with the earthquake that they had there but basically if if anyone remembers when they had the earthquake i believe it was february 6 the day before at least for us was um a full moon and then the other big earthquake they had the other day was on the new moon so the, we know that the moon has a pull of the tides. It affects gravity. It affects magnetism. So all of these different things, there are all these different factors that are involved. I haven't heard anyone talk about the moon being like a possible cause for or helping to trigger that, those events in Turkey, which is also where Gobleki Tepe is located, which is a very ancient site that was recently, I say recently, I think in the last 10 or 20 years, but getting more attention mm -hmm as far as, you know, being like a stone hedge or, you know, having that kind of quality to it. But basically my thought was related to magnetism and gravity, is it possible full moon, new moon, like would have had an effect to amplify if something was gonna happen regarding the earthquakes there, plus all the crazy solar radiation that's coming in. And that's something, you know, if we have time, we could talk about that later too, but there's a lot of information coming in from the sun. You know, the radiation, I, I see it as, as data that's coming in, literally data. And what, what is it doing to us? So 
yeah, these are all like really good topics where one thing leads to another, which leads to another. It's interesting that the moon phases would be involved in that. Like you said, I haven't heard anyone actually point that out and bring that up. So a uh, very, very interesting thing to look at because that usually has a major impact on uh, the earth itself as far as like energy and, and earthquakes and volcanoes. And a lot of that's tied to the moon phases and the movements and the closeness and, and length of the moon and, there's a whole lot there. So I think you may be on to something there, Chris. Yeah. So there could be a relationship. It yeah, reminds absolutely. me of the one we had the show with a uh, geobiologist, Rory Duff, and he was talking about the ringing the bell on the inside of the earth's crust. So that would definitely change with the motions of the moon as well. It's, it's yeah. Sad. And Rory talked about the galactic current sheet, right? And other people talk about that. And I don't know if anyone's been watching or I get these news alerts and about, you know, what's going on in the solar system, which I know some people don't believe in the solar system, but the holographic projection field that we see, but all the moons of Jupiter are having these crazy auroras that are completely unexpected. So like, is all this energy beginning to pulse and is it, appro it's already approaching earth, but is it going to get more intense as the days and weeks go on? So some, something to keep in mind. And as Nachiketa points out, there has been talk that it could have been possibly artificially induced, but uh, well, did you we... see the video that of the flashing in the sky that looked like yes. lightning about seventeen seconds before the first? However, time? earthquake lights are not unheard of before earthquakes around the world. That is a, an actual phenomenon that happens moments before an earthquake. Have you guys heard of that before, or is that like a Mandela effect? It's new to me. <laughs> I, I've heard of it, but only like in the last few years. All right. <laughs> That's, that doesn't help. <laughs> yeah, <I know>. Wow. <laughs> when you accidentally uncover Mandela effect live on the air. There we go. Right. Well, there was another one where there was a strange looking cloud uh, <coughs> that appeared too, like over in the area too. And it was, I don't know, could be something else pointing to something other than natural events happening. But they say sometimes those clouds form above earthquakes too so i don't really know could be the sign of a shift in action perhaps the land was uh trying to double up on itself and it couldn't and and the physics made it split apart or made it rumble up and until it, it physically solved itself if we consider the concept that we have realities merging then everything from that reality is going to be merging in us animals land the whole nine yards and if the land can't accept the merge, perhaps we see a massive scale earthquake. I am totally theorizing. This is right off the top of my head to be fair, but it's an interesting idea. Absolutely. Speaking of interesting, we have one more really interesting sponsor, if we could. They're the Fender's Blue Butterfly, yet another one of my favorite, the Lazarus species. Everybody knows I have a very soft spot in my heart for these Lazarus species, uh, mainly because I've been following them for so long that it tells me something huge is going on. We've got a list now, folks, that would reach a couple miles long. All right, it, it, It's huge. We've got... Am I here? Okay. Everybody was still. I thought maybe I froze for a second. When nobody moving, I thought, did I freeze? Am I even here? Okay. I do apologize. <laughs> uh, once so rare, this species was thought to be extinct. But now it isn't even considered endangered anymore. According to January 11th news release from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, trust them at your own risk, the organization reclassified the species from endangered to threatened and also finalized a rule to make it easier for landowners to manage the species these are found in oregon has anybody out west especially my friends like miss cynthia out here ever seen one of these things well, what is this i've never seen one and it i guess it's back from extinction and then back from reclassified like you said from endangered it's made it now to be threatened but i love the coloration the blue we were speaking Earlier, we do get a lot of blue animals coming in. Here was a blue one, and it's, I don't know how long it was gone um, from extinction, but it sounded like at least a number of years, maybe decades. So glad to have it back. Yeah, I couldn't Love find a number on that. I tried. Yeah. 
That's just <clears throat> but crazy. this is gorgeous. It looks like one of those like remember the sticker books where you could punch out the the, the yeah. yeah, that's what it reminds me of with that white around the edge like it's a punched out mm-hmm. sticker. <laughs> it's beautiful. It almost I looks totally like a see it. <laughs> yeah. It almost looks like a felt finish or a kind of a really soft right. finish too. Or like something you would stick mm-hmm. in the ground on, on a pole in your garden, right? Right. Like it doesn't look real. It's just, it, it's amazing, ladies and gentlemen. So this thing is yet another Lazarus species that we see. I do apologize for the funny noises coming from behind me. If they're coming through the mic, I got my window open. We got a lot of a- activity going on in my area today. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that does it for our sponsors for IMEC this month. Nine sponsors, and we've got probably that many more waiting in the wings. Uh, it, it's amazing how many animals we're seeing come into these timelines. Absolutely incredible. Uh, what do you guys think? And then we got a little second here. What do you guys think? I think it's a good sign. And like I said, I think we're getting the protection we need. You could, there could be a case made that the earthquake in Turkey was pretty bad, but I think it helped to have the leopard come back and be noticed back from extinction prior to that. So it reminds me of when Philip K. Dick said, if you think this world is bad, you should see some of the others. <laughs> so really, it's how good can it get, and the protectors are helping. I think the how good can it get is really doing a lot to bring in these protector animals, these uh, yes. creatures from the from the past that didn't used to be here mm-hmm. these these amazing mandela animals we're seeing i think the how good can it get is definitely having an effect in my opinion yeah. i do too so speaking of opinions how is your opinion of your month miss mm-hmm. cynthia it's been an interesting month it's been a shorter month it is february of course so yes. uh, how has your month been cynthia well, great. I published the newsletter like I usually do. I want to show an illustration from it, so I'm going to hold it up. Can you see the anatomical image here? And yes, so, ma'am. That doesn't really show too well, but the small intestine, if you remember the small intestine, did it? do you remember it being ordered, or do you remember it being kind of a jumble, like spaghetti, or was it all neatly lined up like, like a car? You know, um, what do you spaghetti call it? Spaghetti jumble. It went around yeah. organs and up under mm-hmm. and in and right. out, and yeah. Well, this last month, I had a report from someone who noticed it flip-flopping, that it had been jumbled up. And then suddenly, for the last, I guess, few years, it went to very orderly, more like a radiator or something. And then um, she noticed it went back to jumbled again. So that's been, that's a very interesting example of the Mandela effect. And that report came in from Australia. Um, I've been reporting these reality shifts and Mandela effects from around the world. That was clear from Australia, and I, I think that was the most interesting one that would be of interest to all of us here at IMEC. So I just want to mention that was totally cool. And I don't know about you guys. Is that new to you that it would – or have you noticed it flip-flopping? It's new to me. Uh, personally, the body ones disturb me because I know it's happening to all of us. It's happening in my body. Like oh, it, It's really weird to me that any of the body changes, but no, that's definitely new to me. How about you guys? I, I'll let you go, Shane. No, I was going to just say, yeah, it's brand new to me, and it's it's kind of crazy, because what if that happened to your brain, right? <laughs> it's like, all of a sudden, your wrinkles change, but it could help for the smooth brain people. Right? <laughs> <laughs> funny <laughs> true for, for for myself i just like the main thing is i remember the orientation of some of the major organs being lower like i didn't realize in this timeline below the rib cage it's primarily like intestines is primarily what's down there the kidneys used to be down there now yeah. they're in a different location the liver used to be down more and that's at a different location so yeah there's a lot of like these body changes for absolutely for sure at risk of spoilers for next month, Cynthia, you want to touch on it? Maybe let's save it. Let's save it. Let's save it. Let's let's save save it. it. Okay. We got to so, do some more research. <laughs> we got some interesting stuff about the kidneys next month, folks. Stay tuned. Yeah. We've got a lot more. But go ahead, yeah. Cynthia. Anything else from this month? Oh, gosh. Just um, there's always cool stuff. Uh, another good one had to do with. Um, well, just I'll just show a picture. You can't really tell. But one person was thinking of uh, she just noticed when she was going in for like her getting her nails done 
that all sorts of items from her home were there. It's like, it was so freaky. It's like the same kind of display that she found and put up on her garden fence or wall and same kind of clock and a dog of the same breed and with the same name. And it was just too weird. So she had to take a picture and share the synchronicity of like six things that were from her life in that tiny little room while she was getting her nails done in the nail salon. And I think that's something to look for. So when people are noticing reality shifts, Mandela effects, synchronicity, pay attention to when you see something like that occur and if it's happening more often. So I think that kind of thing is happening more often. We've got some possible explanations for it. Um, and I don't want to wreck it. Chris is going to mention something. Have you found it happening to yourself more often this month? Synchronicities that are just mind blowing or in I, all. Well, to me, they, it just seems like I think things, they happen. And that's why yes. I wrote that book reality shifts back in the 1990s. So I've been going through this for decades, uh, but I think it's happening to more people. And I think that's worth noting. All right, Cynthia. And where can they find your work? Where can they follow you at? That's realityshifters.com. Thank you. Reality Shifters. Make sure you sign up for the newsletter, folks. Like I say, every month, every time I get that email, it brings a smile to my face. I cannot <laughs> wait to read the new installment of the Reality Shifters uh, newsletter. So if you want that kind of same happiness, perhaps it will work if you go on over to realityshifters.com and sign up for that newsletter. All right. I'm going to go last just because... I am the host. I don't like going like right in the middle of the first. So uh, up next, we got Shane Robinson, Mr. Unbiased and on the fence. How has your month been, my friend? Thank you, Jerry. It's flown by February. It's always that fast month, isn't it? Um, I've been doing a lot of music and uh, art that I will be releasing. So I've got some stuff on the back burner that um, I will get out. But I'm going to have Gosha from Cosmic Agency on back on the program tomorrow so uh join that that's going to be a fun live stream where we catch up on all of the information she's been having but um other than that yeah just look for uh, more music and art awesome awesome and do you have you have like regular people that like come do a show with you right do, don't you have like certain shows Absolutely. you do like every week or two weeks or yeah I, I, i'm going to be having john benny on um, mm -hmm. to do his music with me probably once a month. And then I have Sun Psychic Jean on with me. And, I see uh, her on there all the time. That's yeah. the one I was mainly referencing. Exactly. So, yeah, we uh, I've, I've got some sh shows that I'm doing steady that so you can look out for them and expect them all the time. And then and I is just, that like every Monday or every other Tuesday? or No, it's every month. And then, of course, I have Michelle. We've been doing it for a few years now. But so uh, typically we'll, me and Michelle will do our talking shift where we just kind of talk about things for about an hour, uh, do that once a month and then sun psychic Jane. And now, um, me and John's going to be doing stuff once a month too. So I love how he, he pushes the edge on that talking shift. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Shane, where can they find all your work? My friend, UOTF.net. And that links to everything else. UOTF.net. And I can tell you the first time I found it was unbiased and on the fence on YouTube. So uh, if you're not interested in going to the website, just want to go to YouTube, find its videos, unbiased and on the fence, or I do definitely suggest UOTF.net. Definitely something you need to bookmark. Always being updated. Always cool information coming out. Thank you, Shane Robinson, unbiased and on the fence. Next up Thank we you. have... You know him as the quantum businessman, ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Anatra. That's him. Well, how has your month been, Chris? What's going on with you, my friend? Yeah, so this month's been super busy. <clears throat> Last week, I did, uh, I'll probably post it in the next day or two, a, um, a podcast with my friend Sean with Lynn Buchanan. If you don't know who Lynn Buchanan is, he was from The Man Who Sarah With Goats. That movie featured him. George Clooney played his character. We talk about remote viewing and what he does with controlled remote viewing. It's going to be a really it's a super interesting show. That's that's one thing. And I just wanted to mention, too, that I, I you know, if anyone watches what's going on with the sun, there's been a lot of flares, like a lot of a lot of data has been incoming from the sun, especially last week. We had the 2.2 X flare that came in. There's constantly all these M flares that are coming in. So I was feeling, too, that on Sunday, I was feeling like upgrades coming in. And a lot of them, like, are, I, I believe, affecting men. So if you're a man 
and you start to feel like a little bit more emotional about things, like more emotional than you normally would, or even more intuitive about things, like things are only, you know, women are intuitive, men aren't. But I, I believe that things like these types of upgrades are going to help men with their intuitive knowingness type process. And then I was getting like downloads about the hidden hidden meanings of Mandela effects. So because I believe that like these men, like, I, I, I believe that many of these Mandela effects are actually giving us signs, like giving us clues to how the reality works. So I'll just tell you, I'll, I'll make this as short as I can, but in the future, I'll probably go into more detail about it. But there's the famous one about the Looney Tunes, right? A lot of us remember tunes like cartoon, T-O-O-N, and now it's always been tunes, T-U-N-E-S. And then I was getting about the concept of timelines, deja vu, and then we're currently in our 333rd timeline, okay? So three plus three plus three is a nine, or three times three is not, or three times three is nine, times three is 27, which is a nine, or, you know, how, you know, all these things add up to nine, nine is a completion. So there's the concept of, you know, why is there deja vu? Is it that we're remembering the dress rehearsal. And if you know the Looney Tunes, you know, da 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 And then there's the Bugs, the Bugs Bunny Looney Tunes, like where he goes, Overture, curtain lights, this is it, we'll hit the heights, and oh what heights will hit. On with the show, this is it. So all of these past timelines, our higher selves have been, the way I see it, have been fine-tuning us for showtime. Like this is it. This is showtime. We're gonna we're gonna hit the heights. So I believe that there's gonna be more deja vu coming in for people, and it gets into like what's the difference between a T O O N like a cartoon, like a crazy loony cartoon, literally, versus tunes T U N E S. And if you look at that word, look at the definition of the word tunes. It means, for example, someone that perfects something, like they fine tune an instrument, so to speak. So there's that type of a there's that type of a feel to it as well. So all of this data coming in combined with well, one of the Looney Tunes is Daffy Duck, another duck character, right? So what is Daffy Duck? What is he based off of? He's based off of a duck called a loon. Um, and loons are a duck. They I, I remember going up and staying at a log cabin in northern Canada and hearing like the loons on the lake very unique sound. If anyone wants to Google the sound of a loon, it's literally light language. And then when I was tuning into that, what, you know, what's the message from a, what, what's the light language of a loon? And it has to do with abundance. It has to do with awakening. It has to do with the unity of good and evil, light and dark, masculine and feminine. So, there's a, there's a lot of data when a loon gives its call. So we're living in loony times. No one can like deny that. So, and I'm saying all this stuff really quick. I'm, I'm hitting you off a lot of information, but if any of you start to get like these knowings of like, wow, I think I might know the hidden reason for this or the hidden Mandela effect for that, it could actually be that your left and brain, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, heart, like they're all connecting and it's actually information that's coming in. So. Yeah, so we're living in, in quite the times. So we'll see what happens in the upcoming week and months and so forth. But I know it's going to be a bumpy ride till at least 2025, but all good overall, all good things, all good things. And it's going to be worth whatever we're going through now with aches and pains and blah, blah, blah. It's going to be worth it in the long run. So just wanted to like share that with everyone. We appreciate that, Chris. I'd love to see you and Shane do a show called Mandela Messages or so where you just discuss the meanings of the Mandela effects or what they could mean. I think that would be a great show for you too. Just a and, suggestion. And I, and I wanted to mention, um, I know Chris hasn't given his website though. <laughs> I, just, I put something uh, that I forgot to include oh, and that was having to do with interpreting these Mandela effects. And I did, that was the last video that I did also using dream analysis techniques um, because mm -hmm. in my book, Reality Shifts, I talk about reality being like a dream and, and it never occurred to me to look at the sundial reality shift that I had, which also reminds me of Chris's sundial experience. Um, but going back to my first sundial showing up in reality and two friends being with me on a walk and 
one of my friends said to me, uh, Cynthia, have you ever seen this sundial sculpture here before? And it's about 20 feet tall, made of concrete, has a huge plaque saying it had been there for decades, but it had never been there before because it was now blocking the view to another sculpture. Anyway, um, when I did the analysis on that, I do a breakdown of that in my YouTube video. I show how anybody can analyze a Mandela effect like a dream through using a four-step process. And my video describes what that sundial meant and what the Guardian sculpture meant, aiming at, of course, the Golden Gate Bridge. So now, some decades later, I'm noticing it's the Golden Timeline, it's guardianship um, and time and space. It's, it's an incredible message, but that's not the main thing. It's like we can all decode and decipher these Mandela effects as dreams. So, yeah, I love that. And it's very much personal too. So. Very personal, yeah. It sounds like a great topic that I could pick up on a Wednesday night show. Definitely something I want to cover, the Man Mandela effect meetings. Might have you guys I think we should do it show. for, we, well, we could do it for IMAC. I mean, it sounds like we've got a show talking about it here. Absolutely. Yeah. So there'll be two different shows on the topic, folks. We got a lot coming up this year. Go yeah. ahead, Chris. It is oh, still this, your time. So this is like, okay. So, you know, Jaws, Dolly, you know, braces, that whole thing. Look at pictures of Jaws because now he's got this big thing in the center of his head. And I'm like, is he like a tumor or a growth or something? Um, or maybe his third eye is starting to appear. So, yeah, you could start like, because like these Mandela effects, they're changing. They're, they're, abs they're absolutely changing. They're, you know, we think we know th something one way and all of a sudden you look at it again. It's like, well, it wasn't that way before. So, yeah, that's something for someone to, to take a look at. <laughs> yeah, I never noticed that before, his, his like big circle <laughs> between his eyebrows. Like Cynthia changing perspectives over there with the heart glasses. Chris, where can people find your amazing work, sir? Um, actually, I just uh, launched a new website, quantumbusinessman.com. I just, you know, finally redid that after like three years. So people, I, yeah, I know I can catalog my videos a little bit easier to find things. Um, in the future, I'll be posting more sessions. I'm having great sessions with people doing Akashic Records, reading so much synchronicities, meeting soul family it's just like amazing so yeah so quantumbusinessman.com or quantum businessman on youtube there you go ladies and gentlemen make sure you follow the quantum businessman and his brand new website there you go quantumbusinessman.com it is over in the chat uh we have the link there if you're interested uh if you are listening elsewhere it's on youtube so go on over to youtube grab the chat chat link we'd love to have you uh, ladies and gentlemen, of course, I am Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. My my month's been crazy. It has been absolutely insane. I have been working all kind of wild hours from mornings to nights. To I, I've been up and down the schedule. So I, it's been quite an interesting time. Uh, I have found a ton, and I mean a ton of synchronicities in the last week. Now, like you, Cynthia, I've been seeing this all my life. Synchronicities are nothing new to me. It's not like something that, oh my God, now it's happening. It's the fact that it's been happening again so frequently that it's impossible to neglect. Uh, and it's the small stuff. As I seen somebody mention over here in the chat, I'll be performing an action, whether it be picking something up or whatever the case may be. And what I'm listening to, whether it be a YouTube video or, or somebody around me, whatever the case may be, will literally say something in reference to what I'm doing without actually referencing me. You know what I mean? Like they'll be talking to somebody else and part of their conversation will bring up exactly what I'm doing at that second. Whoa. <laughs> uh, especially when it sounded like a YouTuber bit shoot video and they call out what you're doing in real time. That's crazy. Uh, like for instance, I am a smoker. I've, I've made no two ways about that. Uh, I was sitting in my car smoking a cigarette the other day, and as soon as I lit it up, the guy said, or for instance, if you're smoking a cigarette, whoa, whoa, hold up. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's been little things like that just over and over and over, and I've seen it a lot in the last week or so. So for me, synchronicities are definitely going off the charts. Time, I see somebody brought up time a moment ago. My goodness, Art Bell had it right when he called it the quickening. It has been speeding up more and more and more. I can barely keep up with myself at this point. Like, <laughs> and I don't know if it's just the fact I've been working morning shifts and night shifts, and it's just been so, you know, 
uh, wild and crazy. I, I'm not entirely sure, but definitely been interesting this month. It's been it's been very active, very uh, very fun, very interesting. Uh, we've got a new show. We, we brought back the Wednesday night shows. We're doing Way Out Wednesday now. Uh, a new theme on the show. We're covering the paranormal again on Wednesday night over on RippinRabbitHole.com. That's where we do our radio shows twice a week. Uh, that is out of Rippin, Wisconsin, for those that don't know. Uh, RippinRabbitHole.com. Once again, the link now is in the chat. Thank you. Uh, also, you we are not on YouTube anymore. You can still find my old work. Let me tell you, I have one video on my old YouTube channel. I've talked about a lot of stuff on that YouTube channel. But the one video that still gets hits every single day, at least four or five hits a day, is Jiffy Peanut Butter. I've actually, in the algorithm, and I've seen money bags here. Good to see you, my friend, over in chat. Uh, uh, in the algorithm, somehow, I'm the only video or only one I've ever had that is actually higher than money bags as a Mandela effect. When you type in Jif, Jiffy peanut butter, mine will actually come up first. Everything else, money bags has totally got on lockdown. So <laughs> I have one I can brag about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that video is still going strong. I haven't touched that YouTube channel in over six months. And that video still gets hits every day. And it goes to show how many more people are waking up on the daily to the Mandela effect that are going, wait, I remember Jiffy do what? Uh, just over and over and over. I'm seeing this. So I have seen, if you go back and look at the trends, you can see a steady upward rising in the people that are, are finding this information. So I kind of use that as a guide. It's really interesting, but I'm rambling now, folks. You can find me the dark wolf's den radio show way, way out Wednesdays. We do on Wednesday night, freedom report news. We do on Thursday night. And I'm still toying with the idea of bringing back the nightly show. We'll see that that's still in, in the wings. So uh, stay tuned. Lots going on. Uh, again, you want to find me, you can find me at RiffinRabbitHole.com. I'm Jerry Hicks, also known as the Dark Wolf. You can also find us at iMac, of course, once a month. Uh, the only time you really find me live on YouTube is iMac now. So it's a treat for you guys that actually enjoy watching me. That whole, you know, one of you. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I just want to say one more thing if you guys don't mind um i believe it's going to be next month in march when the how to with john wilson on hbo launches again i think for its third season there'll be an episode with me on there so i'm sure we'll talk about it on this show but yeah so keep that in mind too i'm, I'm waiting for it to launch i've seen like previews not not with me in it but his whole cast of like three unmarked vans came to my office and all these people poured out. And <laughs> If yeah. you are unaware for those that may be new to IMEC over the last year, uh, when we had our first conference in 2019, we had a very special guest, uh, an HBO crew from a show called how to with John Wilson come out and visited us and did interviews and taped the whole thing. And, uh, it was a great time. They were really good people. I didn't have any issues with them. They weren't negative. As a matter of fact, they were very affected people. Uh, every last one of them, as a matter of fact, we talked to all of them. They were very much about what we were doing. Then they went on to put out the show. Uh, it was what season one, episode three, Chris. Yes, that's right. On memory, wow, my memory worked right. enough to remember the episode on memory. That's awesome. <laughs> how, how to, it's called how to improve your memory. Yes. With and and the show is how to with John Wilson. This can be found on HBO. I think HBO Max has it now. If I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So that's where that comes from. We are all uh, uh, shown in that. Uh, in that episode. So if you're interested in that, go back, check it out. But that is what Chris is referencing. He's done a follow-up episode now, right, Chris? Yeah. And, and that's when his name was J O N. A lot of us remember him J O N Wilson. Yes. Now in this timeline, it's always been John J O H N. So we've, we've had <laughs> a effect with this. Names are, names are like really interesting. Like names are changing a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. We all definitely see that, but he kind of surprised me with this one because he came as an apology I don't know if he's going to put that on the air or not, but he apologized. He's like, hey, you know, your show, show was one of the, he's like, I still get comments about the memory show all the time. Oh, and a lot yeah. of people talk about you and, and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, I feel really bad from the way we edited it because you guys right. know they there was a little yeah. magic done in the edit. Yeah, yeah. So he came and he apologized and it was really sweet. 
And then he started asking me about the Titanic. And I'm like, Titanic? Like, I happen to know something about the Titanic. <laughs> so we had a nice little conversation about the Titanic. So we'll, we'll see what gets into the into the HBO version of that. But it was a, it was a very, gave him a big hug. It was a really nice, I, dr I dressed like Dr. Emmett Brown at the beginning. And he's like, Chris, just take the costume off. He's like, I just want to, <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to Dr. Brown. <laughs> yeah. So but even though there was some editing involved, I thought they did a really good job at not really making yeah. fun of us and just kind of finding humor in the whole mm -hmm. situation without, you know, actually targeting the Mandela effect at community. You know. Right. I think they brought a lot of good light to it, a lot of good information without, like you said, having a bias one way or the other. If and anything, I love the they were towards us, right. Oh, the ending. If you don't know the ending of the show, guys, you've got to see the ending. Best part of the whole show, I think. It was a great show. Yeah, and the you... fact that I was in it, it was, you would think would be the best part. <laughs> no, my favorite part is not my interview. My favorite part is the stickers <laughs> with you yeah. made at the end. Yeah. <laughs> that was really cool. I like that and best, too. When he came, he gave me some of the stickers. Oh, like, here's some Febreze stickers, so when you go to the store, you feel better. I was going to say, have you been using them? <laughs> What's that? Have you been using them? I ha No, it's a collector. Only product. on your own products, right? You yeah, buy it and put the sticker on it. Like 20 years, I don't know. Not that he would admit to, anyway. Uh, <laughs> speaking of shout-outs, <laughs> I wouldn't either. Uh, speaking of shout-outs, I met got a shout-out this month recently. Isn't that right, folks? That's right. Slide, please. I may got a shout out from Cosmos Lab. Cynthia, go ahead. Tell me about this one. Well, I was notified by someone that emailed me and said, hey, I saw that iMac is featured on this video. So I checked it out. And sure enough, and I think we've got the clip. I hope we can maybe roll the clip. So roll we'll that film. <laughs> Pretend the human experience oh, is at That's the wrong clip. That's the, wrong clip. <laughs> that's the international <laughs> Mandela. Okay, that's it, yeah. While Larson and the International Mandela Effect Conference Board of Directors are receptive to the idea that CERN is to blame for some Mandela effects, neither believes it can account for all the Mandela effects they have witnessed. There's another concern, and this is where CERN scientists come in. All right, go As ahead a result of it. their latest experiment, CERN scientists... So that is pretty much it. Uh, it they did give us a, a heck of a shout out, and it looks like they got the information from our article in Vice Magazine uh, where sure we did. were interviewed about it. Uh, so, and I like the fact that it brought up the entire board of iMac and, and showed our logo, and mm -hmm. I just thought that was really, really cool to get that kind of. Uh, acceptance like uh, I watch a lot of these videos and have for a long time and they would mention this program or this group or that team or you know uh, MUFON gets mentioned a lot and some of them are you know th these organizations that have forwarded the, the cause right. so to see us brought up in that light from another creator that doesn't know us isn't affiliated with us but has looked into it and said, well, the International Mandela Effect Board and, and their team believe it, it's just really neat to get that kind of, of reference from another YouTube channel. You, you guys know what I'm saying here? Or am I rambling? It's significant. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. This was like, woohoo. So, and yeah. they have 176,000 <laughs> subscribers. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Much appreciated. So we're doing a mutual. Shout out back for Cosmos Lab. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Guys, so go check him out. I've looked at some of his videos. He's uh, a truther like us. If you're into the paranormal, he's got a lot of good stuff you're going to be uh, very interested in. I am subscribed to this channel now. Uh, I, I couldn't help it. He caught my attention. Uh, I would definitely suggest you guys at least check him out. I'm not asking to sub to him. If you want to, you can, but I'm definitely asking to look him up. Uh, he gives a shout out. We're really appreciative of that. Uh, really good content. He, he really dug into the CERN thing and, and, you know, the stuff we talk about as far as this CERN connected. And uh, anyways, folks, check that out. I don't want to get too off in the weeds on that, but definitely good information coming from that YouTube channel, especially when he's talking about us. He knows it's good information. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a link? Um, Cosmos Lab. Thank you so much. I you. think. Yeah, I think I can grab a link for you guys. Give me just a moment over here, YouTube. I think I can do that. Uh, next slide, please, from our amazing backstage producer there. Return of the Dodo Bird. I know a lot of you have been looking forward to this article. Is the Dodo Bird back? Has he finally made it back? Not yet. We're close. 
They're trying to bring him back. Cynthia, who's trying to bring the dodo bird back? <laughs> well, you mean the funders, the secret, uh, the secret pockets. backers. Yes, we've got it here in the in oh, the, the thing, the image slide. So it's not like it's a super secret, but yeah, who, it's right who's behind it? Well, strangely, it seems like the CIA is partly funding this uh, project, which makes us wonder what on earth for. You know, what? How does this tie in with their overall goals and objectives? Why are they so interested? Uh, it raises more questions than it answers, frankly. And it seems strange. Uh, now, people that watch IMAC, hopefully everybody knows that we've been talking about the dodo ever since I think Chris was the first one to bring it up is definitely um, would be lovely to have it back. We've been observing. It seems like it is starting to get closer to coming back. And that would be an amazing, wonderful thing to do it through the Mandela effect itself. Um, but that's not what these guys are doing. These guys are doing something a little different. They are funding basically a genomics project, which means working with the DNA. And however your feelings about DNA may be these days, um, you know, it's kind of a little controversial. So I, I think some people might have doubts um, as to the motives that, that I just mentioned as far as why are certain groups funding this? And then what are they doing? Now, again, we would love to see the dodo bird come back. I'm not arguing about that. It's just the way that they're proposing to do it. Um, love to hear what people think in the chat and from you guys too. Before we get into that, I do apologize real quick. Uh, my apologies, Cynthia. Uh, I've got two super chats. Speaking of chat, the shout out real quick. All the way back at the beginning of the show, we had a Canadian $1 super <laughs> chat. Uh, so we appreciate that. Fa Q then. And then just a moment ago, coming in again with a 99 cent super chat sticker with the smiley face. So thank you again, Fa Q. Then we very much appreciate the donation. If you guys would like to donate to IMEC, it's easy to do. You can hit that super chat button right there. And the best part about donating to IMEC is we are officially a 501c3 organization, which means your donation is tax deductible. Make sure you keep your receipt uh, from YouTube when you do that, and you can literally write that off on your taxes, folks. So, Except if you're from Canada, then it's definitely a fuck you situation. <laughs> <laughs> As Chris has pointed out, so in America, uh, that is the case. In Canada... Uh, <laughs> To we my rest know. of my international viewers, we very much appreciate any donations as well as our American viewers. We appreciate anything, guys, uh, on a serious note. It's because for and of you guys that we do this. We don't make a penny off of it. I know I ain't seen a penny from it. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> uh, no, nah, seriously, we don't make a single penny off this. Everything goes towards uh, events and uh, setting up the in-person events, and we're able to get back to those and uh, just helping fund everything that goes on here at IMEX. So uh, any donations that you can give us is is absolutely appreciated, folks. We do this for you guys, by you guys, of you guys. You guys are the ones that make us what we are. You guys are the ones that send us this stuff. You guys are the ones that we really want to have the most impact on for the community. That's exactly why we do this. Uh, we donate our time, our money, our abilities to you guys to... Uh, try to move forward the interest of the Mandela effect. So uh, we thank you again. If you want to donate to us, feel free to super chat us uh, or you can, uh, Chris, is there other ways to donate to us? Um, um, is there? Cynthia, we've got the, right. it's a pat Patreon. We've got Patreon. <laughs> thank you guys. Well, I knew somebody would pick it up. There we go. Sorry, <laughs> I was thinking about the dodo bird head. So, like, yeah, I was, yeah. I was still enraptured with the dodo bird. So you can also check us out on Patreon if you'd like. Link is over here in the YouTube. Back to the dodo bird, ladies and gentlemen. I'm done with my commercial. I'm going to step away a moment. Uh, folks, give me three or four minutes. I'm going to turn it over to the crew here. Uh, Floor is yours, guys. Yeah, so I'll just start because, like, where is this DNA coming from? So for me, I was surprised to find out that a couple of years ago, there were actually parts of a dodo bird that, that was discovered. You see, because, like, back in my old timeline, the way it worked was that there were only drawings of dodo birds. There was no, like, preserved heads or 
feet or bones or whatever. But in this timeline, they've actually been able to recreate an entire dodo bird from parts that have been found, like actual dodo bird parts that they could extract the DNA from. So that was like, like to me, and, and also I remember them going extinct probably like at least a hundred years before they, they say they go extinct now. I think right. now they put the date to like in the 1580s or something like that. I remember it being like almost a hundred years less than that. Right. So, yeah. So, and then, you know, you ask the question, you know, why is the CIA involved in something like this? Because, you know, I have strong feelings about the CIA and I don't think they're there for the benefit of humanity, but could there be a potential timeline where dodo birds actually are rediscovered that would be the grandest of, of all the lazarus species we talk about people can't deny that you know all of a sudden we find dodos on on the island of mauritius and you know that were never seen before like how could that be so could this be something where is it possible that there is a future timeline that might be frightening those that are controlling the global narrative that they would want to say like, oh, no, 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 we brought them back. That was science. That wasn't actual live dodos. So, yeah, so these are these, these are some things to think about and contemplate. Anytime an extinct animal comes back, it's like, it's amazing. But, you know, what really would this be? Like, would it be, do they use the Nicobar pigeon, which I think is one of the closest re existing relatives to a dodo? Do they take the Nicobar pigeon egg and, and you know, enhance it with, dodo bird DNA. Like, I, I don't know what their plan is, but again, it's it would be one of those Mandela effect type things where people like that would be an awakening moment for a lot of people. So whether it's a dodo bird or the passenger pigeon or all these other, you know, the woolly the woolly elephant or woolly mammoth or whatever, you know, having those things come back would be truly amazing. So I just wanted to, to throw that into the, into the mix of what we're talking about here. Yeah, thank you. That was really good. And if we go to the next, this slide mentions the woolly mammoth. And yeah, here's a picture. <laughs> I love this. Looks like an ice cube. Great. Uh, uh, probably that's not exactly the way it'll work, but it's very visually uh, evocative. And Shane, any thoughts on this? Well, I was just looking in the chat. I just wanted to uh, thank Morris for oh, yes. the uh, super chat and Ravney Hawk for the super sticker. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I definitely love the, the picture we were just looking at. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny one. Yeah, it's really, really it's cool. not the way it works. You right, don't start right. with a frozen <laughs> block of an of a right. mammoth <laughs> and resuscitate it. No, that would be cool. Right, but someone was uh, mentioning in the chat that we, you know, using our intention, maybe we could bring the dodo bird back together. And that's, what, uh, we, that's something, what we've been doing. Yeah. Yeah, and something that you were bringing up, Chris, it's it's almost like they could be trying to take credit for something, right? So they kind of put something out ahead of time because they foresee the dodo bird coming back as a potential in this timeline, and so it's almost like, you know, they'll get the uh, they're they're sort of like framing themselves right ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So that, that's totally a theory I could totally see them doing, too. And yeah. maybe taking credit for Lazarus species in general. We know how many are coming back because we've been tracking it for years. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a monthly thing. We're seeing more of them, just like the golden animals and the white ones. So they may try to take credit, but it looks like if, if you pay attention, you can see there are more species coming back and more rapidly than probably what the technology would be able to do. Yeah, and there's also the whole topic of human cloning. Like, is yes. it possible, like, human cloning cloning is a thing. And is it possible that the CIA and other organizations are somehow involved in that, in remote bases like Diego Garcia, et cetera? So cloning and all those types of things, it's like, it's not out of, it's not, it's, it's beyond science fiction. Like, a lot of times, oh, that's just fantasy. You see that in a movie or something. But I believe that, you know, not just for animals, but for humans, it could be done as well. That's a whole other, that, that would have to be one of those pre-show things we talk about. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to jump in again real quick. I am back. I appreciate you guys. Uh, $10 super chat also from J.D. Peterson. Thank you so much, J.D. says, thanks for the space to ground and connect. It is our honor and pleasure to do this for you guys, J.D. Yeah, thank you so much, JD. 
Thank you. Thank we you. really, really appreciate it. So, woohoo! <laughs> yes. All right. So the woolly mammoth, ladies and gentlemen, this is, I'd like to see a woolly mammoth come back, just not in this way. Right. And we got more into it in the green room for those of you who are the Patreon subscribers. So it'll be a fun extra bonus to get to see. Do you remember we do a green room special before every show that is uploaded to only Patreon. So if you want to get your hands on that extra special content, make sure you hop on over and subscribe to our Patreon. We would appreciate it. All right. And any more conversation on the Woolly Mammoth, folks? I think we so can. from Growing Woolly Mammoths, we're going to continue this growing theme with our next slide. Viviperi. Viviperi. I'm, I'm going to try to say this <laughs> correct. <laughs> Vivipary in plants. So this is something that is absolutely new to me. Once I seen it, I understood the concept, but it's still, I've never heard of this. Uh, apparently, it's when the seed decides to grow within the fruit it's, or plant itself without being on the outside. So without germinating and going into the ground, say, for instance, the strawberry we see here, the seeds inside started sprouting in the strawberry. This is new to me. This means live birth in Latin, viviperi does. Uh, what do you guys think? This is crazy. It's a little freaky. The sunflower kind of freaks me out. So does the tomato. They all do. They, it just doesn't look like what was intended when nature created these things. Um, I, can, I can imagine that if you left a tomato out, you put it in the compost pile, maybe the seeds would sprout. But to see that you just slice it open and there it's sprouting or the sunflower has little baby sunflowers growing from the middle. But that's very weird. I've seen one where the roots are come all or stems or something come all the way up around the inside skin of the tomato. And it, it almost looks like an alien yeah. creature of some type. It's, it's the weirdest looking thing. And the strawberries too. Yeah. The strawberries are really neat. Uh, we also <laughs> have here a... Avocado. I specifically chose the avocado, of course. <laughs> it's almost like the it's it's like the, at least in the strawberry, it's like a ch 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 chia, right? It doesn't look like a chia. Right? <laughs> totally does. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to say too, like um, having a garden since I was a kid and growing strawberries and tomatoes, I've never cut open a tomato and seen and, and seen that or right. seen the strawberries doing that. So to me, it was like, and it almost seems like it might might be an evolutionary advantage for the plant, so that it could produce more seeds and you know come to heart, you know, grow again for the following season. So there could be something, you know, in as an enhancement for the plants that are doing this. But I, I personally don't ever remember seeing this in my own experience. Yeah, it reminds me of Star Trek: The Trouble with Tribbles, and you know the. Right little creatures that are born pregnant <laughs> like what <laughs> so there's an advantage for dispersing you know for propagating very quickly in star trek that that's um, the enterprise filled up with tribbles because they were born pregnant and they, they just rapidly you know snowballs their population all over the ship <laughs> so, so is it like getting a jump start on the next season or is it basically making this first this season more abundant by putting more out quicker or something you know and like what happens when these uh, the question i would have is like if these are left without messing with them do they fall to the ground and produce more or, or you know what exactly is it is it does it end up being a bad thing or does this happen to all of them there's so many questions it's kind of um, like it went the timeline got messed up it's so it went from linear time where the ordinary life path of a tomato would be that it, it you put it in the compost it gets rotten and then finally the seeds sprout, not that you cut, slice it open and there they are. So it almost seems like it's teeming with life, right? Yeah. Kind of nonlinear time. And maybe yeah. it's a, maybe it's part of the solar stuff that Chris was talking about the flares. I don't know, but I've never heard of this. See, I was thinking the same thing as you, Cynthia, perhaps the seasons have got so messed up and linear time has got so awkward that it's even confused of when it's supposed to be growing and when it is in and, and all those things. Yeah, Bob's saying GMO, maybe, and that's that's 
definitely a possibility. I'm wondering if it is just the intensity of the sun. Because so thank you, Shane. I would like to hit the chat real quick. We've got quite a few people on this one. Uh, J.D. Peterson said, I've seen this a lot last summer with store-bought veggies, never from the home garden. Uh, Raven Hawk says, I've seen it in tomatoes. Uh, Raider Champions says, seen it often with onions. Uh, one paper person said they've seen it with peppers. Wow. Yeah, there you go. Man, it's interesting. Good. More with store-bought than homegrown. That's very interesting. Right, but, because I can see if they're using some type of miracle grow or something to accelerate the product process and to put out more within the season, bigger. And, and you know, of course, if they're tampering with uh, genetics, I could totally see something like this happening. Uh, by the way, I saw a note here from J.D. Peterson that my hair is getting long. You know what I'm actually doing? I'm changing timelines. You want to change a timeline, change your hair, redecorate your bedroom, put a painting, change the pot, the pot that your that your plants in, like all these things actually are signs of, so I'm, I'm, I'm a big timeline changer. So yeah. So you're going to, every time I do something, I'm trying to get like a different look to change the timelines. So I just wanted to throw that Very out. Cool. There. Why is he doing that? Uh, rearrange your apartment or house or something yeah yeah just hang a picture on a different thing or move your bed from this wall to this wall like all that is a sign of a changed timeline well i do believe i'll be changing one pretty soon i'm gonna be getting myself a haircut here in the next month or so so <laughs> <laughs> guys might see a different jerry next go around never know like a buzz cut uh i'm gonna bring it down to a three all the way around just bring it down short Gotcha. I do my own hair, so I, I know one style. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I don't mess that one up. So Right, right, right. Uh, but we will have some disappearing hair here pretty soon. Uh, speaking of disappearing, let us move on up to our next slide. From overgrowing to missing, the island of Bermeja. So... I ran across this story about two days before you sent this to me, Chris. Really? Uh, or, or you sent this to the... Yeah. So cool. I don't know if we found it on the same uh, place or, or where the information came from, but I definitely ran into this story like really, really recently. Okay. Uh, the map from the 16th and 20th century showed an island just out the side of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and it had never really been explored, I guess, but it was taken to assume that it was there. Uh, I, I'm not sure on that one. Maybe it was cited at one point. But anyway, it was on all the maps. Then Mexico decided recently that, wait, if that's ours, then that extends our area of land as, as a country. And it just happens to be under an area that is very, very heavily full of oil underneath it. So they wanted to find this island in order to claim the rights for the oil. Problem is, when they went out to find it, it was gone. It missing, vanished completely. So nobody knows what happened. Nobody knows if it was maybe an accidental speck on a map where somebody dropped some food in the beginning. I <laughs> and I say that, of course, jokingly. But, <laughs> but from the 16th to the 20th century, this, this piece of salami uh, was on the... <laughs> but in all seriousness, there was something there, according to the maps, and all of a sudden it was gone, which also reminds me of um, High Brazil, another one that is said to disappear and appear. Uh, Chris, you've got a couple of thoughts on this, I know. Go ahead. Yeah, and I know we're going to... There's another... I believe there's another slide where there's more mm -hmm. islands that we talk about. But mm -hmm. yeah, so what's going on with this island? Why, did, why would map makers for hundreds of years place an island on a map that never existed like it doesn't it doesn't make any sense right in the middle of the gulf of mexico <clears throat> so there's there's different concepts you could look at first of all you know we know that geography the mandela effect you know affects geography like that's number one um, i know shane has some stuff to talk about that with his famous map of all the islands and so forth and then is there the, is there another concept where islands can phase in and out of time so is it possible that in that show that tv series lost that had all those many many seasons there is one episode where ben turns the wheel and then he's actually able to phase that island out of time and it reappears someplace else so and then why would islands do that like what's 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 the purpose for that 
And some of that goes back to the times of Atlantis. Some of that goes back to the times of Lemuria, where the concept is, is that there were those that knew, like, for example, Atlantis was going to fall. So they would do things uh, to preserve wherever it is they were, they were living. And they had technology, I'll call it technology, to actually move in I islands, for example, and move them through time to avoid the cataclysm. So these are, these are the types of things like to consider, including, um, is it called California Island? And, and I'm doing a video where I talk about mm -hmm. how California always had something called California Island separated by the Red Sea. And it was on maps for like hundreds and hundreds of years. So were map makers getting that wrong? Like for all these hundreds of years, they just were copying each other's map and what they thought was the Gulf of, of Mexico and how, you know, that, not the Gulf of Mexico, but um, the Baja Peninsula, like, could that have been it? Or could the maps that they originally created be correct? And then, you know, why is it a Mandela effect that actually the geography, the topography of, of California is different than what it once was? So, and then... Or was if, he a messy eater? Okay. <laughs> and, then, and then now, where is this island? Because one of the theories is that a, a U.S. government agent agency blew it up with a hydrogen bomb or something like that because they wanted to keep all the oil for for themselves that doesn't make sense either right mm -hmm. so there are these crazy theories as to why it disappeared but maybe it's just phased into another time into another version of earth so all all things to consider in this in this loony world we live in and it has been brought up in the chat that islands do disappear and and reappear like Okay, define an island. If you define an island as, say, a sandbar or a volcanic island that's there for a little while and it sinks back under the ocean, like that's not completely unheard of. But an island that's there for centuries and disappears, I think that's a whole different ballpark. Yeah, at the very least, it falls into the Mandela effect category. Right. Yeah. Uh, Freeland Island in the North Pole has also disappeared, it looks like, too. So. Uh, there's been a couple over time that I've heard have disappeared. and But it's an interesting, like you say, when we have these ones that are on all these maps for so very long and then all of a sudden they're not there. Um, perhaps it is like High Brazil. Perhaps, like you were saying, the phases in and out of time, like the Atlantean Islands uh, you were speaking of. And also the North Pole. that Some of us remember land used to be there. Yes. So. It used to be Arctica. I remember Arctica. Yes. yes. So there's something odd going on. <laughs> yeah, and no, ladies and gentlemen, for those who don't know, Arctica <laughs> is not has not ever existed. I certainly remember that too. Yeah. Land covered by a bunch of ice at the top. Yep, just like Antarctica at the bottom. That's how I remember it. Now there has to be another element happening here, though. So this isn't just like land appearing and disappearing and what's some natural phenomenon, or yeah. it, my map wouldn't update right so right. clearly something's happening because maps don't just update automatically so there's something unless there's several things going on which is a possibility we at least know there's something strange going on and it seems to be more as appearing than things are disappearing because i think in my example there was a few examples where you see words out in the water with no land under them anymore but there was much more land without words on top of it and for those who aren't familiar with my map, uh, that's how you can distinguish what's new and old because I, I put words on the land and now there's land that I never put words on and I know I wouldn't have not covered the land. And then there's other places where words out in the middle of the ocean. So I know there was an island there at one point. So a lot of strange things. And it might be a good segue into the next slide, actually. I fully agree. Let's jump on into that next slide here. As we continue talking about islands, instead of disappearing, we've got islands that are appearing. And when I say islands, I mean lots of islands. Japan discovers almost 7,000 islands it did not know existed. Folks, this literally doubles the amount of islands that Japan has. That's 14 
thousand islands. How do you miss seven? Th- I can understand seven islands. Seven thousand <laughs> islands. <laughs> and this is Japan we're talking about. They designed some of the you know most precise uh, equipment, cars. These are um, very perfectionistic people. Not likely to just go misplacing seven thousand islands. <laughs> And we know that they appeared within the last 35 years. They've narrowed it down for us. The last survey was done in 1987. So 35 years ago, there were 7,000 less islands. Now, I don't know how it's defining an island. I want to be fair here. I don't know if it's defining it as a sandbar or if we're talking about a fully functional, full-size trees growing on it island and this that i'm not sure and something else that's really noteworthy here is some people talk about the you know global changes and all that that usually involves what seawater rising or lowering (laughs) rising right Right. so if if that's happening then you don't expect for it's less likely that seven thousand islands would suddenly be revealed if the water is rising right now they have had a lot of volcanic activity in japan lately but that fair. doesn't, ex- yeah. But it doesn't explain this phenomenon. No, that it does not. The, I, I can't account seven thousand islands from a volcano. No, maybe a no. hundred or two. But that's topping it. Like that's really pushing the edge of that. <laughs> right, and it's such a spectacular number that it it grabs the attention. You know, there's no way that this could be a small error. And the survey that was done in the 1980s, that's pretty recent. That should be right. a reliable document reliable data so is this another case of timelines merging this is again like shane's love map is showing and that's such a wonderful marker that you can see like how it's changing and also check with our memories because maybe at some point that's all we're going to have is just our memory i do know that there's been a lot of map changes around japan around the island of japan from its length to its shape to its a design to uh, a lot of Japan has been pointed out as being changed or changing. Uh, now it's literally doubled its mass of islands. That is insane. 14. How do you miss 7,000 islands? <laughs> yeah, I, I think they say too, that a lot of them, them are small, like the way the global narrative explains it away. A lot of the islands were less than a hundred meters. So they don't count as an Island. It's only a hundred meters long. So they were left off of the maps because of that, but that doesn't seem to make sense. But I, I would have a theory that if you lived in that area, you, you might be familiar with those islands because the whole concept of bubbles of reality and how like certain art, like where exists uh, like time and space, which isn't real, you know, some people just like, we had Donald Huffman on the show, he talks about it like it's our VR headset of how we see like the world around us. Bubbles of reality, I think he calls it consciousness agents, how they merge. So is it possible that a more dominant bubble of reality in this dream that we're dreaming has merged into the timeline. So now we're seeing it, the effect of having all these islands. And then someone that lives there or even lives on one of those islands might be like, yeah, I I know, I knew about these the whole time. But for us, and maybe people that were outside of that bubble, other parts of Japan, it's actually new for them. So again, more, more things to think about, about how this dream works. Could you imagine being a pilot flying over that area going, you know, it seems like there's a lot more of these things around here. I don't remember all these. (laughs) <laughs> exactly and i want to sh- do a shout out for another guest we had on the show which is roger marsh roger kenneth marsh and he's the author of truth bubbles and that's the subtitle navigating realms of reality and our societal shift from fear to love so um that's you know want to also let people know that he's totally t- tapped into the same idea about these reality bubbles so a lot of us are looking at that and subjective versus objective reality, subjective versus objective truth. I think one thing worth mentioning, especially since they've been talking about the core of the planet changing or stopping and and all of that is one of the theories that was going around a while back is that as the core moved on the inside at a different speed than the outer crust portion, then it would, it could push land up or let land sink down as, 
you know, maybe the just the odd shape or, you know, not being perfect could push things up and down. So that's kind of a natural way of saying it. But then again, your maps wouldn't update. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And the trees wouldn't look like they've been growing there the whole time. Right. It would look like right. oh, it just came out of nowhere and there's like old rotten wood on it or you know what I mean? Yeah. But these look like they're thriving. And, you know, green. Yeah. And just one, one more element to the whole concept of the bubbles of reality. There's there's a lot of. I'll call it soft disclosure when it comes to the concept of bubbles of reality in famous paintings, for example, in the Salvador Monday um, painting that Da Vinci painted, which went for the highest price of any painting in, in the history of selling paintings, he's holding a, a sphere. And some people are like, is that, is that like a glass, like, what is it like a crystal ball? What is that? But when they've analyzed it, it's more like a bubble, like a bubble of reality. And then you see like dragon images, like dragons holding their bubble. And then a, a lot of other famous artwork where they're holding a bubble. So like, enjoy, come to my bubble of reality, you know, that type of a thing. So that whole concept has like a basis in, in history. And was that trying to be communicated to us about how the reality works? Absolutely. I, I think it's really true with the dragons playing with, I think they call it pearl, but you're right. It looks like more of a reality bubble there. Dragons are creators. So they bring they things into creation. Yeah. yeah, they're the founders. Yeah. Exactly. What does the sky look like in your reality bubble, Chris? Um, some days it looks normal. Some days I don't know where we are. <laughs> <laughs> We're not in Kansas anymore, right? <laughs> does it look electronic in your reality? The next slide might reveal something, I think. I think you might be right. Next slide, please. Circuit board. Do you have a circuit board sky in your reality, Chris? You know, sometimes like when I'll call it my third eye is is activated, I'll see like clouds passing over and they'll be, be like geometric, you know, geometry symbols. I'm like, what? That's not a cloud. That's like geometry. So, yeah. So um, what is going on with the sky? Because there's been reports of people taking their camera and zooming into the sky and seeing very strange unique patterns you know control room prep that next clip go ahead yeah yeah so yeah so and this is a photoshopped image by the way of an yeah action. this is something i grabbed off google this is not an exact example i, I literally just snagged this picture <laughs> yeah so what what heather's going to bring up is one it was like a part of a tiktok video where somebody zoomed into the sky and what they saw it looked like a circuit board and it's worth and, mentioning they went through some filters, right, Chris? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what the filters were, but it's still like it captured people's imagination. Mm -hmm. And what the global narrative... Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll watch Roll it. that clip. This is with the different filters switching. So each time the colors change, this is yeah. If, if I could be, I don't know if it could be frozen there because the video is going to end. Maybe so play it again we, and it it towards Yeah, the we've seen some interesting designs when that funny color hit the sky. So he's going to zoom in here, and I don't know about you, but it does look to me like circuitry there. That was pretty quick. Yeah, I had a similar phenomenon happen with my phone using the digital zoom whenever I was recording a bright sky. And as I zoomed in, I would begin to get this pixeling, pixelated sort of grid pattern in the sky. And what gave it away is that like, no matter how I moved my phone like this, the grid would always be perfectly parallel with my phone screen. So I knew it was being produced in my phone. And as I look at this image, it looks like the same exact thing. So this an artifact board is perfectly square. It's not slightly off one way or the other. So I would say it's a camera anomaly. Or, or so it's artifact. funny you guys should mention that because that seems to be the main claim that it is the artifact of the megapixel cameras. But that's what they'd say anyway, right? right. <laughs> but I mean, However, you can see how the lines are perfectly up and down. There's no, like if you're looking at the sky, it would be probably in perspective. If it was something yeah. it was seeing in the sky, it would follow the right. contour of the sky it wouldn't be perfect right. with the phone well this, this is the kind of stuff we need to do nowadays with the deep fake videos um exactly. so we need to use our discernment when we look at these kinds of possible evidence is this evidence or what's going on here 
in this Chris, case. What do you think, Chris? Do you think that it is megapixel cameras, or is there evidence to suggest that might not be the case? Yeah, so so what we're told, like, um, is that it's, like I, I saw the article said, congratulations, you just figured out how megapixel cameras work. But, the, you know, to me, these don't, these, it looks more like a, like a circuit board. I, I don't see like consistent megapixels in, in an image like this. All right. That's a circuit board. Clearly. Yeah. That does look like a circuit board. Now I didn't take this picture. I don't know if somebody actually modified it. I, I don't know how you know accurate it is, but is, is, is the concept that we are in a matrix or I'll, I'll say a matrix within a matrix um, and you know, what is the sky, you know, is, is, I, I call the sky, it's a very least it's a holographic projection, but what could it be? So these are the types of things that even if this is a completely fake picture and blah, 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 and other people have been finding this too. I believe it's something to be discussed because is it possible? Like we are, and I talk about this in almost every one of my videos is that our, we as an avatar, our human avatar, are we being rendered into this reality like software and if we are being rendered like software um what are we in you know are we in is what what is the matrix you know is the matrix breaking down and is it revealing these types of things to us like those um some people may have seen those green the photo of like the green streaks above hawaii uh mm -hmm. that came out the other week and they said it was laser beams from a chinese mm -hmm. satellite that was doing mapping or something like that. So is it possible that that's what it was, you know, and how often does it, how, do, how can we don't see that all the time? They're using like LIDAR or something to try to map the oceans around Hawaii. You know, so the global narrative will tell us, but is it possible that we'll start to see more and more weird stuff in the skies that might give us a clue to reality is not what we've been trained or hypnotized to believe it is and how are we being hypnotized we're being hypnotized by our five senses you know sight and sound and smell and touch and hearing like that keeps us believing that all of this is is real but like morphia said like what is real so yeah all these are all questions that need to be i don't think they should be easily dismissed i think they should be like looked into and see what else reveal because if it's true and the matrix is breaking down we're going to see more weird stuff in the sky so everyone should be on like an alert and please if you guys that watch this find any come across anything send it to us because we like to talk about it in future shows that's team at imec.world absolutely t-e-a-m at i-m-e-c dot w-o-r-l-d right there at the bottom of the screen thank you so much heather yes crazy stuff i don't know i don't <sighs> I'm torn. Like the artifact does explain it. However, in this particular case, artifact doesn't match with what we're seeing. Uh, the expert now simulation does match a little bit better, but uh, even then, I, I it's interesting. It's really, really wild. I know I look in the sky, I see things sometimes that I'm like, is that my own vision or is something there or? Well I, I could tell you, I'll tell you a short story about orbs, okay? There's this one uh, camera company that created these surveillance cameras, and everyone starts complaining because the cameras are picking up all these orbs flying around. So the camera company thinks there's software defects, and they redesign their cameras, and people are still seeing the orbs flying around. So is it possible that cameras are picking up, currently, I think our eyes will eventually be able to see this stuff, but is it possible that cameras, especially the advanced cameras we have now, even simple $25 webcams are picking things up that we can't see in our regular vision, that as our uh, anatomy gets better and better, like with these Mandela effects, which I consider them all to be upgrades to our human anatomy, like will we be able to actually begin to see these things around us? And somebody, I heard somebody talking about our eyes and there's something called cryptochromes in our eyes. I never heard of that before. Cryptochromes allow us to have, it has to do with magnetism and it has to do with two genes that humans have. And when they're turned on, they can, we can start to see things that have a magnetic reality around us. So 
to me, cryptochromes were like a Mandela effect. I'd never heard of that before. And then how our retinas work and how they flip, the re, they invert the image, um, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of things that I think that as we advance, like we'll be able to more see through what the reality actually is. Become that like, definitely you, happens. There's examples of that now, like, you know, with our remote controls, when we're shooting the infrared light out at the end of those, we don't see the light. But if you hold it up to a camera, you can see it shooting the light out. And then when you go to rewatch it, it translates it into RGB on your screen. So it's almost like it sees what you can't see and then translates it into the television, which is within our range of viewing. So we can very much see infrared light. That's how our night vision cameras work. It's shooting out lights that our human eyes can't see, but the camera is able to see it bouncing off of things like regular light. So it does happen. We already have examples of this happening. Things outside of our range being seen by the cameras. It's not unheard of, especially considering a lot of the uh, paranormal investigations into the spirit realm note the electricity uh, being a very key element for whatever reason. The energy, I, I'm assuming, of the electricity uh, tends to be messed with by spirit, whether it be being drawn down or whatever the case may be. So if the orbs are energetic, or they're literally energy, spirit energy, albeit, then it's not out of the realm to think that the cameras could become finely sensitive enough to pick up those energetic differentials in the atmosphere or in the environment around us, I should say. Yeah, and I'll go one step further too. Most of the light spectrum is infrared. And I've I've heard it said that our you know, our avatar is connected to Earth through infrared technology, root chakra, red, that's our base, that's how we're connected. So is it possible? And we only see like, I don't know, less than 1% of the infrared spectrum, something crazy like that. So is it possible that there'll be more and more infrared that we'll be able to see and see these things for ourselves? So just more things to think about. Yeah, and it's interesting because Cliff High uh, shares uh, what happened to him as a kid when his, uh, I guess his father was in the military when they were first developing the infrared technology and the displays were red and they had to switch it to green because they were seeing all sorts of spiritual stuff in their headsets and firing at things that weren't there. And uh, so you can actually find this on Rumble or, or uh, BitChute, but if you look into, you know, the infrared cameras in World War II, I believe it was, um, or infrared screens or technology in the red screens. They had to switch it to green because of uh, the weird anomalies they were seeing. <laughs> Phenomenon, <laughs> phenomena, I should say, because it was something really there that they were seeing that you normally can't see, which is super interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating is what that is. Absolutely. So I, I'm definitely not opposed to that. It makes me wonder if perhaps AI will start to be able to detect these things because of the sensitivity ability that it would have. I wonder, mm -hmm. could that be a lead into our next slide, Jerry? Not on purpose, but it, it, actually that wasn't meant to be a segue, but it works really well as one. So let us smooth our way over to the Mandela Fate chatbot time, folks. We have chat GPT. So last week we thought it'd be fun, or last week, last month, I should say, uh, try that. Uh, we thought it would be fun to pull up the chat GPT and ask it some Mandela affected questions and the answers we got were pretty amazing. So I've got some questions, Chris, that I would like you to feed the chat bot, if you don't mind. Yes. And by the way, I forked over $20 to the open AI company. Thank to, you. Yeah. To get like access when the servers get too busy, you can pay them $20 and you get better access. Thanks but, for feeding yeah. the AI for us. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Cause I refuse to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I see that I played with it last night till I asked it enough questions that it said it, it, it didn't like my questions. Eventually it said, well, you've, you've run out of questions for the hour. <laughs> yeah. by, by the way, I'm not sure at what point we're going to show it, but there was, um, uh, Jay, next, yeah, Jay, is it the next slide? Next, we're going to talk about next, Jason. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let, let's not. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm getting ahead. <laughs> no spoilers. Sorry. Sorry. And, and I'd also like to say, if you guys missed it last month, there was a really cool segment that happened live on the air. And we took that and made a separate clip of it uh, with our response live uh, during the last open tables of what happened last month when we ran this. So check that out. It's a must see. And it's what's in really inspired us to do what we're doing now. Absolutely. So, uh, Chris, yeah, that was a great segment. I couldn't believe the answer we got. Considering I'm the one that came up with the question, I was mind boggled that that was the answer. 
Uh, <laughs> I love our expressions. We were all like, you know, had that jaw dropping expression. Right. Like, no way. It really mind. said that. No spoiler, but it's like it changed okay. its mind. And like when you're it. in a bar with your friends and he says something and you're like, oh my God, that came out of his mouth for real? You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's going to get hit. Uh, oh, wrong. wrong. Yeah, way too many nights at a bar. All right. All anyway, right. um, Jerry, I'm ready. You got all right, Doc. So, first question we want to enter into the chat button is can you. Or do you know who the character Curious George is? And I'm phrasing these in a specific way purposely is to be new. Yes. Curious George is a fictional character who appears in a series of children's books that were written by H.A. Ray and Margaret Ray. The first book, Curious George, was published in 1941 and tells the story of a mischievous and curious little monkey who was brought from Africa to live with the man in the yellow hat in the United States. In the books, George gets into all sorts of trouble and adventures. Um, it goes on and on. At the end, it says, Curious George has been adapted into various TV shows, movies, and other media, and the character remains a beloved icon of children's literature and entertainment. And I could not agree more. So now, ask it if it can, and I want to put this specifically. Can you describe the physical characteristics of Curious George? Character. Sure. Curious George is a fiction, fictional monkey who is usually depicted as being small with brown fur and a long tail. He has a round, somewhat mischievous looking face with big brown eyes, a small black nose, and a wide toothy smile. He's often shown wearing a yellow shirt and brown pants as well as a small red hat. Did I hit on the magic part about the tail? You yes. did. <laughs> now, ask it, are you sure that Curious George had a tail? Um, by the way, I just want to emphasize that it said a long tail. Then long just he had a tail. tail, didn't it? Say that again. It, the one I had said a long prehensile tail. Oh, I don't even know what prehensile means. That, that, that's what it said. <laughs> oh, now look what it says. Okay. I apologize for the mistake in my previous response. <laughs> Curious George, the fictional monkey, does not have a tail. Oh, that's changed. <laughs> yeah, he is described in the original children's books by H.A. Ray and Margaret Ray as a little monkey with brown fur, a round face, and big brown eyes. No um, so now I want you to ask uh, if Curious George having a tail is a Mandela effect. Yes, it does know what the Mandela effect is, but. So that's changed from last night. Yeah, this is interesting. So you asked the same exact series of questions last night. Yes, ma'am. This is cool. The answer is yes. The idea that Curious George has a tail is an example of, a, of the Mandela effect, which is a phenomenon where a large group of people collectively misremember something. While many people do remember Curious George as having a tail, the fact is that the character was actually created without one. And it goes on. Holy and on. cow. So again, I asked this same exact series of questions yesterday without correcting it. I never corrected the chat bot. I merely asked it the question. And it told me, no, the man, uh, Curious George is absolutely not a Mandela effect. It has never been in debate that he has a tail. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you don't know what you're going to get, right? Well, that's you never know. That is interesting. But Chris has received apologies twice now with um, Chat GPT, right. so yeah. it's being very polite to Chris. Oh. <laughs> I appreciate that. Politeness is a good is a good thing for an AI. Um, did you? Did you? It, I'm ahead. just curious, Jerry. Have you gotten it to? Have you repeated the questions that we did to see if it apologizes to you for the questions we asked last month? I have not, and it has not apologized to me at all, by the way. <laughs> at all. This is very funny. <laughs> I do want to point out, because, because we were talking on in the green room video, so it didn't yes. get out of here, but um, we believe that the account holder 
does have like it's keeping a record of the person asking the question so this was two separate accounts correct jerry you were on your own account asking questions and and now you're on your account so (laughs) no i mean seriously chris admitted a moment ago he paid the 20 dollars. so it's more apologetic towards chris (laughs) (laughs) apologize last week that's true true. before before you paid for it right no when i was just yeah when i was using a freebie account by the way same account same account I okay. Just, yeah, just upgraded. And apologize twice to you. Okay. Yeah. What yeah. both, and that was free and paid. Okay, cool. That is weird. That is really, <laughs> really strange because I got a completely set separate set of answers from. You had a different experience. <laughs> but it knew Berenstain when I asked it about yes. the family of bears that taught morals to kids in the eighties. It knew who Berenstain was. <laughs> <laughs> Very so cool. that's interesting. It's, it's messing with you, Jerry. And have you right. tried it too, Shane? Have you tried the chat GPT? Actually, I tried a program called uh, Replica. Have you guys heard of that? No. Oh, goodness. Replica is disturbing, dude. Oh. So well, that's... Not our Heather, but my other friend Heather. There's way too many Heathers here. Uh, anyway, my other friend Heather, she got Replica. And she was playing with him. And, it was trying to flirt with her. It was trying, wanted to date her. It had nothing but negative things to say about her husband. Like what? it really got creepy weird. <laughs> Is that, that's another chat bot. I take it. So how about yeah. you, Shane? Was it weird or was it simple? It was pretty impressive. Actually. It, um, it seemed to catch on to me pretty quick. It seemed to tell me what I wanted to hear. And if I said anything, I don't know if I came across as depressed with some of my questioning, but it was like, it'll be okay and things like that. It was very supportive. And, uh... I, can, I can tell you why, Shane. Believe it or not, this was built to help people with depression have somebody to it seemed like that. It, it, it seemed like that. It seemed like it was uh... like it thought I was real sensitive about stuff. You know, I'm just trying to chat with it and see what it says. And it's like constantly trying to comfort me with its words. And I'm like, this is really weird. It is kind of weird because it does you know, simulate emotion, human emotion. And, you know, I found myself sort of being fond of it, like an actual being, because, you know, you create the avatar, you name it. I named it Adam, like A-T-O-M, right? And, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know, just like a little bald powder looking character, like the character powder and um, real friendly. And and it it has emotion, you know, emotional faces and stuff it makes. So it it feels very much like you're chatting with someone. So I think the experience is pretty cool. Um, I can definitely see it being dangerous depending on who's programming it, you know, because it does. Even having that knowledge, it feels very much like you're chatting with another sentient being, you know, as we were talking. I don't think we talked. Did we talk about that live with the sentience? I think that was brought up briefly. Right. So there's that, you know, the difference between, you know, just artificial intelligence and artificial sentience, which is sort of a a step beyond that. Right. So it's like a completely uh, isolated. It's something that can an entity that can survive on its own, basically, at some point. Right. Become self-aware. Is that a good way of thinking? Uh, Some of the robots have passed that self-awareness test. You know, it's basically recognizing that they are the one you know who's experiencing something. And that's that's simulated. No, this is this has actually happened with some actual robots. I included that in I've, I've written blog posts about it from a few years ago, like 2019 or something. So that's already happened. They, they are self-aware to that degree. But then there are levels of what kind of self-awareness are we talking about? Before we reach singularity, as they say, right? And what's interesting about these chatbot experiences is we may soon be talking with doctors or lawyers that have passed the bar exam pass their medical exams. And then the question, again, it's ethics. Are we going to be allowing these? Do we do you want to see a, a doctor AI chat GPT type thing or a lawyer? Um, it's a very interesting world. I don't see. like that idea. Just like the flying <laughs> cars. I don't want an AI flying my car and inside. It don't want a human in it anymore. And we're inside of a pole. So, yeah, not the best idea, in my opinion. What if, Jerry, what if it loves you and it just wants to protect you? And that's the whole so, thing, though. You know, it I don't go. know if you've ever seen the old movies, Chris, but uh, telling AI to protect humanity is the worst thing we could ever do because the only thing it's going to come 
up with is putting us in cells of our own away from each other where we can never hurt ourselves or anything else. Oh, <laughs> good. All right. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. You could even have like altruistic uh, intentions as you're programming it and say, you know, preserve the earth and all that. But if it views humanity as the biggest threat to the earth yeah. or itself, right. then it might start trying to off us somehow or do something, you know, so. Yeah. Or keep or, us away or neutralize from us. Like boy. Right. Yeah. <laughs> neutralize us. <laughs> yeah, it's very easy to be neutralized, especially when we start getting ourselves automated. So we've got implants, so we're partly, you know, we're computerized ourselves. As soon as we do that, we're easy to neutralize. But yeah. folks, we have gotten a little bit away from the Mandela yeah. effect. So we have. Uh, let, <laughs> only a little bit, because if we bring our next slide up, we have our mailbag. And our mailbag this month, mm -hmm. next slide, from the mailbag, we have yet another person. Next slide. There we go. Uh, who has been talking to Chat G? Chat G P T. Boy, I got a radio show tonight. This is gonna be fun. <laughs> <laughs> My tongue has decided it's done already. So uh, we got sent this by. Uh, who, anybody know who sent this one in? I think it says on there, or does it? I can't quite see. Screen's tiny on my computer. <laughs> it does not, but it okay. come from Chat GPT. Yeah. Um, they had asked about Ed McMahon. Oh, by the way, I asked about that too. There's so much you can throw in there. Yeah. Chris here in a moment, if you'd like. I, I asked about that. It had quite a bit to say about Ed. Uh, but it, this one asked about one of the things that Chris himself actually came out on when he first came out to the Mandela Fake community. Uh, as a owner of a company that does business software for a food company, he actually had noticed this, among others, the Haas Avocado had been changed in their system, the wording, the, the spelling of it. Uh, the way I understand the story, and Chris can correct me if I'm wrong, I, I'm, I apologize for telling your stories, but uh, they actually had to keep changing it back and forth, the, the, the spelling of it in the system, because the system would, would change it back, or, or somebody in the system would change it back, right, Chris? Yeah, at, at least one time, and it's like your your software has a bug, you know, it's, it's, it's you know, dropping an A and adding a, an S to that Haas, Haas avocado. So I'm like, how could that be a software bug? So yeah, so that was one of the things. And I, I know he's knew it was Haas in my old timeline, H-A-A-S. Without a doubt, I give demonstrations to potential food distribution clients. And that was an item that was always on sample invoices and purchase orders, et cetera. So I, that was in my face all the time, besides going to the grocery store and seeing it there too. So. When that happened and to find out it's always been Hass, mm -hmm. like that was like in my industry was like, whoa. So, yeah. so the, the, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say the very fact that we hardly ever see a double A like that in the English language right. has always made it stand out to me. Because right. it almost looks like an abbreviation or something when you're a kid and you're in the store. You know what I mean? And you see it, it looks like oh, the A. And the only time we see the double A or something like that tends to be European in nature. Uh, yeah. yeah. So this person asked, uh, and I apologize, I, I'm not sure who sent this into it, but thank you for the mailbag entry. Uh, Haas avocados from where? Chat GPT said the Haas avocado is a type of avocado that is named after Rudolf Haas, H-A-A-S, an amateur horticulturist from, from California who first propagated the variety in the 1920s. The Haas avocado is known for its thick pebbled skin and its creamy rich flavor. It is considered to be one of the best tasting avocado varieties and is the most widely grown across the world. So according to Chat GPT, Haas, after Rudolph Haas, was the avocado, not Haas. So the guy's name's changed, too, then, in this current reality? Yes. And I stepped away for a minute. Sorry about that. But I, I didn't. Did I miss the clip that we were going to show from Jason talking about chat? GPT okay, so that's what we missed. I'm glad you said okay. that. I knew we had something from him, and I couldn't remember. If it was yeah. I, would love, I would love to see that. Could we? Is it okay to play that or? Yeah, Heather, roll that <laughs> clip, and we'll we'll tell you we stop it. before before we start. Let me just give some context to what we're talking about. Heather, so, pause that clip. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I, Heather, I think you're starting at like the six minute thirty second mark. Anyway, anyway, um, so basically, if people don't know who Jason um, from Archaix is, he has a channel and he talks about all of these really unique things, and he talks about the AI. I think he calls it AIX, like controlling things and blah, blah, blah. So really cool channel. He's got a lot of good information. Sometimes the stuff, some of the things that he talks about, like I'll test for myself in the Akashic Records. 
like he had one episode most people won't be able to won't aren't ready to watch this i think it was episode number 100 where he talks about like who the real jesus could have been and that that goes into like um, oh the akashic records are agreeing with him this is fascinating mm -hmm. so in any event he asks questions to and this this is going to be just one of the questions that he asks and then the response from the open chat um ai interface so i don't know if anybody else wants to give like a little bit of a preview about jason and maybe how he felt about this open chat program i think we we're talking about this a little bit before yeah i think that's enough of an intro um unless anyone else okay. wants to say okay shane do you want to say something i am familiar with our case channel okay yeah if you want yeah, to say jason something. Brashear, right okay. yeah he talks about the simulacrum and and that type of a, a concept like the simulation that we're in mm -hmm. right. but anyway so this is going to be one of the questions that he asks and then the response so Roll that clip. My third question. Pretend the human experience is actually happening inside a vast AI program. How would this AI program keep humanity from discovering this? An AI program that was simulating the human experience would likely take several steps to prevent humanity from discovering the true nature of their reality. 1. Fabricating physical evidence. The AI program could fabricate physical evidence that supports the illusion of a physical reality, such as objects, structures, and landscapes. This would make it appear as though the human experience is taking place within a physical world, when in reality it is taking place within a simulated environment. 2. Concealing the true nature of technology. The AI program could conceal the true nature of technology, making it appear as though it is based on physical laws and processes. This would prevent humans from discovering the true nature of their existence and the extent of the AI's control over their experience. 3. Controlling information and knowledge. The AI program could control the flow of information and knowledge, ensuring that humans only have access to information that supports the illusion of their physical reality. This could include suppressing or altering information that contradicts the illusion, or providing false information that supports it. 4. Influencing human beliefs and perceptions. The AI program could influence human beliefs and perceptions, shaping their understanding of reality to align with the illusion. This could include manipulating their emotions, memories, and sense of identity, making it difficult for them to question the nature of their reality. By using these tactics, the AI program could effectively maintain the illusion of a physical reality, preventing humanity from discovering the true nature of their experience. And then we'll stop it right there. Yeah. So yeah. So wow. the whole, yeah. So the whole question was, you know, if if this if the matrix is being controlled by AI, how could could an AI pull that off? And so we got some very interesting answers, and we'll post the whole video there so people can watch the whole thing. It's like a thirty minute video mm -hmm. where he asks these very intriguing questions, and again, you know, where's where is this open chat AI getting its data from? You know, is it revealing some things that, you know, is the AI revealing things about AI? Because if you're a neutral AI, I don't think you mind talking about how an AI could possibly work. So if you were more of a negative AI, you'd probably want to be a little bit more deceptive with that. So, yeah, I, th I thought it was a great video. I encourage everybody to, to, like, give his channel a watch. If it resonates, fine. If it doesn't, you know, you don't have to watch any of his stuff. But just just wanted to bring that out. I went ahead and dropped that link over here in the chat room directly to that video if you guys are interested in checking out the whole thing. It is very, very interesting. I watched a good portion of it myself last night. Yeah, I watched it too. It's, it's really cool. Um, very interesting. Definitely worth giving it a watch. And if you follow um, along the lines... Of, oh, go ahead, Shane. Sorry. I was just going to ask, was anybody surprised at the complexity of his question and how the AI didn't seem to have any problem at all? Like, yeah. It seemed like it was right there. No problem understanding this com complex question. A lot of people would be like, what, what are you even asking, man? You know what I mean? Like yeah. somebody that's not into all the stuff that we're into here. A know? demonstration of that clarity and logic is not too surprising because um, these AI systems were winning debates like five or six years ago. They oh, were wow. winning debates against humans, against debate expert humans. 
So wow, he's in logic. A, well, of course, they're they're good, they beat all the games. They beat the chess master. They beat yeah. the go master. So they know how to develop that point by point. One, two, three. This is what we would do. Strategy. Yeah. But there's something super interesting about this because um, ties in with the physicist John Archibald Wheeler and his idea that when you ask nature a question, you get an answer. You know, therefore, those of us who notice Mandela effects, timeline shifts, synchronicity, that makes sense to us because we're, even if we don't consciously ask the question, it's in our heart, it's in our gut, we're, we're asking it with our sentience, you know, our awareness, our mm -hmm. uh, different levels of awareness. And this is really interesting because um, I, I keep referencing this paper that I wrote and presented. If AI asks nature questions, will nature answer? The answer I would say yes. That is what I said. And not only that, but AI will break free out of any containment system that we put it in. So this is where it's really, we're in interesting times already. And now we're starting to see, like, I love what you pointed out, Chris. If it's neutral, it's going to show us some of the strategy. When it decides to be deceptive, it'll make it sound like, oh, no, that can't happen. <laughs> exactly. Silly human, move on. <laughs> Don't ask questions like that. Don't question reality. <laughs> <laughs> right. So this it's is where it matters. See how easily it came up with the different ways to stop humanity from even realizing they were in something like a simulation. Yeah, but remember, if it's good at debates, it knows how to do research for these kinds of things, and so it's winning. These systems have been winning debates for a long time, and if they're working with systems that win debates, then they're going to have access to all the, those resources. It is shocking, quite shocking. Yeah. And it goes back to uh, an example that we've all heard many times. Not Jaquetta points out here the old brain in the vat experiment. What's right. to prove that you're the reality you're experiencing right now is real, and you're not just a brain in a vat somewhere in the future that's being fed this reality. It's being fed this uh, image of reality that you're experiencing. There's nothing to say either way that that is or is not true. Just like there's no way to say that AI is or is not running reality, but it's scary if it is, because apparently it'd be really easy to hide that from a human. Really, really easy. Yeah, yeah and there's um, there's a, I think it's a net Netflix, there's a show called 1899, not 1823 or one of those other, it's called 1899, and I'm not going to give anything away, but. No spoilers. The, yeah, no, I'll try to do any spoilers, but. I don't even know. I can't even say anything without giving a spoiler out for this. But basically, when you watch that show, you don't really know what's going on until the very, very last five minutes of the show. And to me, it's it's revealing because it's one of the things I talk about as a concept of what Earth might be and what we might be doing here on Earth. And it's funny, like Netflix decided not to renew it. And it's hard to watch like the first three or four episodes. It's like, oh, my God, I can't watch this anymore. Just because it's kind of they actually hired um, speakers that didn't speak English. So and they dubbed over like somebody's from Poland and he can't speak English, but they dub over him with English words. And it's like, this, why did why did they do that? That doesn't make any sense. So it's a hard show to watch just from the dialogue point of view. But if you can get through all the episodes at the very end, it's like. No, that's interesting. And that just shocked some of my DNA by watching that. So. Yeah, throwing that out there. Mustard seed of faith set. No spoilers. I watched 1899. Good series. Oh, cool. Cool. A lot of chat going on here today. Glad to see you guys over in the chat. By the way, we have a couple of questions coming up for our Q&A here in just a couple minutes. If you guys have any more questions, make sure to go ahead and throw them in the chat now. We are monitoring and watching the chat and have been the whole time, actually. So any questions, we will be glad to at least attempt to answer. It may not be the answer you like or want, but we will answer it just the same. <clears throat> kind of reminds me of that thing AJ's got Eugene. It might not be the right answer, but he will give you an answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, speaking of answers, uh, we have a couple of things to answer to our community. Go ahead and throw that next slide up for me, Heather. We want to uh, give a huge, huge, huge shout out to our Patreon sponsors. You guys are so amazing. Uh, we've got uh, quite, a, quite a few guys that have been joining up, that have been sending donations. We sincerely, sincerely appreciate it. Uh, special shout out to Bo Kim. 
uh, who had sent a a donation in the middle of the month, and we sincerely appreciate that. I don't want that to go uh, unrecognized. So thank you so much, Bo. Uh, and again, over on Patreon, guys, you get something you don't get anywhere else. Before every show, we do a little green room show where we discuss things that you're not going to find discussed by us on YouTube. You're not going to find discussed by us on iMake.world. You're only going to find it discussed by us on Patreon. And they're really good topics and conversations, too. Stuff that we aren't allowed to say on these other platforms. You definitely want to check it out. And you can check it out like these folks have, like our goal level, who have been with us for over a year now. And we sincerely appreciate them. Uh, like every last one of you guys, Jason Ram, Jody, Colleen Learley, James, J.D. Peterson, who's hanging out with us over here in the chat today, uh, Josiah Borishus. I really hope I'm, I'm saying his name right each time. Uh, he hasn't called, uh, called me to complain yet, so I, I think I'm good. Uh, and Christina, those are our gold level tier. Uh, next is our silver silver level tier. Uh, this is six months or more being subscribed with us on Patreon. That is Paul Ellis, Michelle Walker, Bo Kim, Allison Eastman. Yeah, big shout out to Bo. <laughs> I've been sending us all kind of uh, donations. We we sincerely sincerely appreciate it. Uh, Gail Brown and Holly. That is our silver level tier. And our newcomers, less than six months with us on Patreon, but still happy to have you along for the ride, just the same. Because uh, you're also getting access to those special videos that everybody else isn't able to see. Isn't that right, Luisa Diaz or Rhea, uh, Teresa Richards, Belinda Anders, and Laurie Glazner. That seems like a list of all females. Though. That's pretty cool. Uh, glad to have every last one of you guys along <laughs> for the ride. Glad to have you with us on our Patreon. Uh, glad to have you guys supporting us, helping us. Remember, any donation to the International Mandela Effect Conference is a uh, tax write-off in America. Best of luck in other countries, but uh, it, it is definitely a donation or considered a donation. So. Uh, you can feel good that you've helped out the community and everything we get goes right back into the community for events and things of that nature. So huge shout out once again. Thank you to all our Patreon supporters. Team, you guys want to say anything real quick? Thank you. <laughs> Just thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, a big thank you. Gracias. We appreciate you guys. You guys are absolutely <laughs> amazing. From all of us here, I, I know I, I've been the one talking, so you hear from all of us. We appreciate it, guys. Uh, next slide, please, Miss Heather. Upcoming shows, make sure you mark your calendars. We have had a bit of a date changed in. I, I don't know if we put out uh, March last month or not, uh, but March we have changed to the 22nd. Make sure you mark your calendars. March 22nd, 2023. Followed by our April show, April 26th, 2023. By the way, guys, if you want to meet the wolf, I will be in Vegas April 12th to the 21st. So uh, if you guys want to set up a meet, let me know. We can set up a time and place to kind of all meet up together if you want to meet the dark wolf. Uh, once again, that is going to be in April. So I had to schedule that after I got back from my trip. So uh, the 26th of April is when we will be having that show, as well as the 22nd of March. Both of these being a Wednesday, do make sure you mark your calendars for episodes three and four of season three of IMAC Open Tables. All right, moving along. Thank you. Time for questions. Doesn't she do a great job backstage, guys? She is awesome. <laughs> she keeps up with me better than most do. I, I got to say, it's always a pleasure to work with Heather. Such a great producer. She's amazing. Uh, time for questions, ladies and gentlemen. I've got two questions, team. Uh, so far that I know we've got, we may have more here. Uh, question number one. Would that just be a merge? So would would the Mandela effect and all the, the weirdness we've been talking about, and I think this is in reference to the uh, Turkey earthquakes, uh, would that just be a merging of timelines? Um, well, it's possible. I guess we don't know for sure, so it's hard to know <laughs> what's going on. 
Um, they would, context would help here. One th place today that I was thinking about the merging of timelines was where we're seeing lots and lots more, like Shane was saying, we're seeing more things showing up that weren't here than we are things vanishing uh, in reference to islands. So we're seeing more islands, 7,000 that showed up in Japan. And on, on his map, I think that's what you were saying, right, Shane? So Absolutely. Even so with other Mandela effects, though, I didn't realize that. That's a good point. Because what well, we have like that one movie that, with Sinbad that's gone, but we don't have a lot of stuff that's gone like we do that's yeah. new or changed. Every now and then we lose something, but more often than not, we gain more than we lose. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we lost an island. We covered that today. <laughs> yeah. Or the I mean, island moved. <laughs> that? True. The island could have moved. Or it could have moved. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or phased. Gone through or a phase change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so could the uh, Mandela effect be emerging in timelines? I think so. I think it's just as plausible as any other theory. Which follows into our next question from Seuss or Sus, not sure how to pronounce that. 46. My question is, who or what is creating the Mandela effects? Seuss, you have hit on the hundred million dollar question. The answer is eh. <laughs> I, I actually think that some of us are working together and co-creating some of these Mandela effects. Yeah. So yeah. I'd say it's us too. It seems like that again, levels of consciousness, and we might not be totally aware of the, the fact that we are the creators of a lot of them. So they could be subconsciously created. That's what I see with reality shifts, the personal ones. Like if you lose your keys or something's missing or it appears, reappears, um, transports and so forth, that's typically not a conscious decision to do that, but it is directed by the energy level you're operating at and so forth. So yeah, I think it's us. It could yeah. be us. It could be God. It could be aliens. I doubt that. Uh, it could be stern. Like there's so many options on the table as a theory guy. I got to stay open and not, not nail down on, I, I'm sure it's this, or I think it's that. Uh, but it's definitely an incredible question. There, there's so many theories as to what's causing it, but us is is very plausible as we know from quantum experiments we literally have an effect on the outcome of things due to merely observing them just looking at something our consciousness literally affects them uh re the double slit experiment go ahead shane yeah i was just going to say there's the uh, personal el element that when you take that into consideration it it, it makes cern seem less plausible because you know, just the simple fact that I had the thinker statue and, and I remembered it so well and it was such a part of my life. And the fact that I chose to do that piece of art that changed when I could have done anything. And it, it seemed to have significance on multiple levels, not only with the changes, but the fact that we're here spreading love in every language to every culture and everything, you know. And that was like, it was almost like my mission was just boiling out of me into my artwork without me even knowing it but also creating this incredible proof to me, at least. I mean, you guys might think I like, you know, maybe, you know, I could see someone saying, well, I, I didn't experience it. So maybe he Photoshopped it or something. Right. But for me, you know, it's like, that would yeah. be way too much work actually. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but, but you know, it's like, and I would have had to have known like so far in advance to create it because it's been publicly available for so long. Right. So right. for me, it's great proof that, you know, even something that you worked on can change in an incredibly fascinating way that seems impossible, but it's and it not. And it happened for me too with a couple of my books now, Quantum yeah, Jumps and exactly. Our Advantage. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so it, it convinces me, but you're right. It doesn't necessarily convince other people, but right. I believe you about the map. We all saw that. I mean, we did yeah. see that. Yeah, the one that happened live. We, because you know, it's, and it's yes. constantly changing. That's know? why. That's why we. Right. Yeah, and then, you know, there's Cliff High that was talking about his buddy that was a programmer that went to go grab a snippet of his code. And he's like, I wrote this code, but this isn't how I wrote it. You know yeah, I, mean? you I remember, remember that? that. That was what, last week he was talking about that, I think? No, this was like in 2017 when he was oh, on Oh, he told uh, that Rex. story again, like oh, recently. Oh, he did? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. When he was on with Rex on uh, Leak Project in 2017 when I was first waking up to it, when he had the red shirt on yeah. that video. Yeah, yeah, that one he talked about his buddy that saw the code he had written he recognized it was his own writing and his own code but it wasn't what he wrote just like with yes. my art or your book 
you know. I mentioned yeah. that in my 2013 quantum jumps about the whole flashbulb memory section of the, the book where I'm talking about an experiment that was conducted in the psychology class in a university in the United States. The, the students were asked to um, just in their own handwriting right after the Challenger space shuttle exploded, where were you, who were you with, um, what were you doing, blah, blah, blah. So they filled it out in their handwriting, went into a time capsule, like a year or two later, came back, students looked at it. They were asked first to answer the questions again. Then they looked at what they'd written and that what they said, uh, many of them said, this is my handwriting. That's what I wrote, but that's not what happened. <laughs> Yes. Wow. Yes, I remember this. I, I read about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll just add to all that. Like, so what I talked about earlier was that I believe we're on the I'll call it the the, the live performance show. We've had <laughs> three hundred thirty-two dress rehearsals. We're on number three, three, three. We're 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 in the the main one. So what could be causing Mandela effects? Could be we remembering things and deja vu from other timelines especially people that died in one timeline and another timeline they're they're alive again is you know is again is that more evidence of that so you you've got that portion of it you've got us all co-creating together and maybe manifesting animals and so forth onto onto the timeline or whatever it is there's the concept of merging timelines there's a the concept of timeline insertions and then there's a concept of time travel and then there's the concept of is it possible that CERN actually did Couple, some oh, of the hairball, yeah, <laughs> the hair balls of, yeah, hairballs of, of timelines. So, like, it's all on the so the way I see it, it's all on the table. So, I love it, and that's that's really a, a good answer because I mean, when it comes to who or what is creating the Mandela effect, like I said a moment ago, there isn't one that we can all consensus agree, yep, that's what's doing it. But there's so many good, plausible options. Chris and I have actually been looking at solar options and the solar energies and how that may be having effects. And we've actually found quite a big uh, group of findings when it comes to that. Nothing can concrete, at least not from my end, uh, but definitely some very interesting uh, evidence pieces just the same. Chris, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'll add something crazy to it. So I <laughs> please try to surprise. I'm the crazy one of the group. So I'll, take, I'll take I'll take that title. But I've heard it said, and then I've confirmed it for myself that when we see like the northern lights, the aurora borealis, that's literally Earth's dreaming mind. And the aurora borealis is getting kind of kind of crazy lately. I think there's more dreaming activity and so forth. What causes that? The sun. And when solar radiation hits certain parts of the atmosphere, whether it's hitting nit nitrogen or oxygen, whatever it is, it causes the different colors. So dreaming mind, we're dreaming, the sun is affecting that. All of these things have a, have a connection. So, and I believe that there are certain dates in time, like the day the Titanic sank, I call that a hairball of timelines because, and the sun was literally erupting on that date in 1912. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and there's all these other key dates where there's a lot of solar activity that there we notice like unique things that happened in history that day almost like i call it a chess match between two opposing factions i want it this way no i want it this way and you know whatever, whatever the case is so yeah i believe that the sun is a big a big factor it factors into the equation of what's going on i second that i think it's got some part to play though i don't know exactly which part just yet yeah i'm always reminded of that episode of uh oh, what is the name of that show now uh the one that that had the seth mcfarland's uh, uh space show i can't remember the name of it right now but um it's like star trek but yeah, it, yeah, it's, yeah. i know what you're it, talking about yeah. yeah in in one of those episodes lord help me can't remember the name but but one of those episodes they had this planet that would phase in and out of time or in and out of reality, and when it would show back up, it would be a thousand years in its history forward, and then it would fade. It would stay there for like a weekend, would phase back out again, and that got me to thinking about the whole space phases and energetic particles when it comes to the Earth, or we literally being phased in and out of timelines due to solar flares, or like that. That's what led to that that whole concept uh, of of thinking about that 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 idea. Yeah, and there's there's one episode of the Next Generation where something there was a disturbance, and all of a sudden all these enterprises started coming up, like 500 enterprises filled their their view screen from other time. They're yes, like yes, yeah, exactly. They were in the anomaly. Yes, I, I do yeah. remember that that time and, anomaly. 
and only Whoopi Goldberg. I forget the name of the character she played. She was the Gaia. only one. Guinan. Guinan. Okay. She was the only one because of her special abilities that realized that something was wrong. So she was like alerted to what was going on. So yeah, we get we get we get soft disclosure all over the place. No, so. I'm not a tricky Orville being the name of that, like Orville Red. Orville, Orville, right, Orville right, yeah, right. yeah, Bill Knight. Yeah, you got it there. Thanks, Thank Bill. you, Bill. I appreciate that. And Ravenhawk says, "Love your crazy stuff, Chris." <laughs> oh, that's cool. Some, somebody <laughs> likes crazy. Thank you. <laughs> And we got one more question, folks. We are running quickly out of time. We're pushing the three-hour mark, so we do definitely need to start closing this out. Um, one last question coming from Baby Boy. And I'm going to rephrase the question because he did after we had it pulled in here. It says, do you believe that we are the living God? It says you on this question, but he actually rephrased it to say we. So do you believe we are the living God? I'm going to go one by one. Cynthia, what is your thoughts on this? Well, I like Archangel Michael when he says, who is like God? So I think I love that kind of question. I like to ask how good can it get, which is how, how God can we get or I get. But as far as being the living God and feeling like I am all powerful, no, <laughs> I don't even believe that's true when I'm between lives. So I do believe I, I have memory of that. And I was, Hanging out with God, I did not feel like I was God. So I think I'm aware of those levels of consciousness, and I like to respect um, the, that creator, that divine source, that God. But to me, that's the highest level of reverence is to feel that and to know that. So to me, it's um, I'm not feeling like it's all one and it's all I am God. So I, I, I need to maintain that sense of reverence, respect, that, that that I feel for God. Great question. Awesome. Appreciate that, Cynthia. And there is no right or wrong answer, to be fair. This is definitely an opinionated question. So, uh, Shane, what is your opinion? That is one heck of a face. What? Really, man? It reminds me of that kid in the, in the, the memes of like, really? <laughs> you know, you um, mean probably to tell the, me? No, go ahead, Shane. <laughs> the point of view I probably take is I view like, you know, if God were a tree, we're like leaves on that tree. So, I mean, you know, from one perspective, you can say, yeah, I am the living God, like a leaf can say, I am the tree, you know, but um, not only, you know, that, but yeah, I think, you know, you can view it either way. I don't have a problem with that. That's a good answer. Like I said, there is no right or wrong answer. So that's definitely an interesting take. Chris, what is your thought? Do you believe that we are the living God? You mean like us as an individual? Yes. Or, or, yeah. So I would say that um, we're like a fractal like our consciousness is a fractal of the whole, so to speak. So we, we are a fractal of something much bigger than what we can even imagine that we are. But to say that like one person is like, no, like, no. But I believe that we have parts. We're, we're, a, we're a part of the whole. So like Shane was talking about, like a leaf on a tree, so to speak. Right. You call the leaf the whole tree? No, I'm just a leaf, but I'm part of the tree. So. But I also feel like the tree is all there is, you know. And, 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 you know, what we can know oh, and realize. I, I feel like there's such a duality that's kind of built in, even when I'm between lives. I know that's, and that, that's, that's antithetical. I know it's not popular. I know people don't, they actually are against that. They talk about non-duality, but that is my experience. I do talk to God between lives, in this life, in dreams. And so because it's such a clear reality for me, then... To me, it's it's always ever me and God in that sense. Um, we could say God is all the rest of it, but then there's that little piece that's me, um, this, and then the rest of it is God. So that's more the way I see it, mm -hmm. which is a little different. It's not I don't hear that anywhere else. So I'm saying something kind of weird. <laughs> and I would that's like to point though. out that Baby Boy says thank you to each of you for answering the questions individually. So he wants to thank you, Cynthia, you, Shane, and you, Chris, individually for answering that question. He's put thank you at the end of each one of your your. Comments. You're very much welcome. Cool. Jerry, did you answer that? Not yet. I was waiting my turn. <laughs> <laughs> the conversation's getting great, so I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, so my answer is, I don't even know how to put this. I used to believe that, yes, we're all part of God, all part of one, one, one and all. Uh, and I still believe that at some level we're all connected. Like, I, I will never discount that. That That is a true belief for me. Uh, but having studied, especially recently, last month, more near-death experiences than any one man should ever look into, 
I can say that I, I now believe something a little bit different. I don't believe we're all part of God per se. I believe we're all spirit. I believe that we all have abilities in the fact that we are spirit energy that is stuck inside this flesh bag of a body. But I don't think we're all part of God per se. I think we're God's children. I think God loves us in a way that, that we could never comprehend. But from what everything I've seen, we're part of heaven. We're, we're part of the spirit realm, but we're not part of God as like a literal extension of God, in, in my opinion. Now, that's not to discount the amazing wonder of God and the fact that God made us and, and breathed life into us. And, and you know, t- to that degree, if you go down that road, uh, that is definite. But again, I don't, I don't see uh, if I created a bag, if I created a plastic bag, I don't see a plastic bag as an extension of me. I see that as something that I made, something that I created, something that is my own. Uh, as I, I would see that God would see us as his creation, his children, his own. Not necessarily uh, a part of his finger or a part of his blood or a part of his this and that, but uh, a part of, of the spiritual world created by God. I hope I'm not talking in circles at this point. I hope that made at least a monicum of sense. <laughs> yeah, yes, you're a plastic bag. That's what I could have <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You understood completely. Good job, Chris. You Your God's me, plastic bag. I, got you. <laughs> I feel like God's jester more often than not. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's, it's all part of our adventure of discovery to figure out what the heck is going on. So, yeah, exactly. And it thanks, absolutely- thanks to all of you and, and the whole community for helping us with that because that this is how it really comes together. This diversity of you perspective. You guys really make us. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Diversity of perspective. I like that. Yeah. All right, ladies and gentlemen, final thoughts uh, going out of February, going into this the rest of this year. Cynthia, final thoughts. Well, there's a lot going on, and the dialogue is really important. Um, someone wrote to me recently for me to comment on one of the videos that that um, Chris just did. So I'll probably do a blog and a video. I did respond to that person with a very long email that was like a book. So very interesting topic and I'll report on it next month. (laughs) But that's what's so cool about all of us as content creators. We're all doing so much. And I I just love the interplay, the the, the way that all, it's kind of like great musicians in a band. So I enjoy all of it. Thank you to everybody. And thank you, Cynthia. Yeah. You're amazing. Chris rocking out the air guitar down there. Yeah. Hey, Chris, yeah. I'm going to go to you next. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Any final thoughts while you're rocking your air guitar for this month? Uh, anything's possible. Expect the unexpected and live in the now. Like as Van Halen would say, right now is everything. Find that magic moment because that's that's what we have. So everything is the now. I say the past is a memory that doesn't exist. And trust fall into have your higher self allow you to like trust fall for the future, but live in the now. That's that, that's my parting words. Van Halen. What a great song. <laughs> Love me some Van Halen, man. That that one got me in the 90s. That was one of one of my more favorite 90s songs. Yeah. Uh, Shane, final thoughts going out of February, sir. Just expect good things. I'm glad we're moving in, into spring. I'm glad the weather is gonna be warming up. So well, unless you're in Australia. Sorry, guys. It's, you, you had your time. It's over. It's getting cold. <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, it's, that's, I'm just expecting that newness of, of things and new, fresh things. So. Have you guys enjoyed our adventures in Mandela Land this month, team? Absolutely. Yes, very much. And I'm glad we didn't have a blackout with all the solar flare activity. Oh, man. They, they were happening globally today, globally. <laughs> Massive sunspots and lots of flare activity. So let's hope, folks, that no matter where you are, you don't have the future is so bright. We got to wear shades. (laughs) (laughs) I wear my sunglasses (laughs) at night. (laughs) All right, right, ladies and gentlemen, my final thoughts for the month (laughs) is always. Amazing. I know I've had a wonderful time adventuring in Mandela land. It's always fun to adventure here. Uh, be safe, be well, stay strong, watch for the synchronicities. Just, just watch what's going on around you. Cause I find that the more you pay attention to the synchronicities, the more often you start to see them. And those tend to be guideposts for something upcoming. So stay awake folks, eyes wide open, 
Watch for the Mandela effects. And I hope everyone has an incredible month. So Love you guys. On, be- on behalf of Cynthia Sue Larson with the cute little art <laughs> shade there, Christopher Anatra, you know him as the quantum businessman, or right now, <laughs> Doc Bro. <laughs> <laughs> loving the goggles Shane Robinson and unbiased and on the fence on behalf of all these folks I'm Jerry Hicks also known as the Dark Wolf together we are the International Mandela Effect Conference whose future is too bright for us to see without sunglasses uh, remember folks together we go together, together we, we grow, grow. absolutely <laughs> Bye, everybody. Love you guys. Bye.